Hello. Hello. Hey, how's it going? Good. How are you? Good, good. Um, yeah, thanks everybody for joining. I'll probably wait just like five minutes like I did the last couple of times and then we'll get into it. But uh, I think I think most of you guys have been, yeah. I think Keenan, you might be new. Nice to meet you. Um, and the rest of you, thanks for thanks for coming back. We'll probably, I think we'll probably spend most of the time talking about the moral landscape. And then I was just going to talk about like the no lying part and how it fits into that at the, at the end. But, um, but yeah, we'll see. Uh, and in this time, instead of doing cat pictures, I've gone with some AI art that I'm hoping you'll all enjoy. Of cat <laughs> pictures? No, last time I had cat pictures in the deck. This time I've created some custom, uh, custom inter-intellect Sam Harris uh, discussion hmm. AI art. So I'm hoping you guys will enjoy it. But yeah, I'll just give it like three more minutes. Sam Harris. Sam, Sam Harris. Sam. Oh, sorry. I think um, we're having echoing issues, Wish. I think. Can you put in headphones? Oh no, it's good now. It's cool. Sorry, we're in the same house in different rooms. Um. Anyway, okay. I'm gonna start sharing the screen, and then people can filter in, and if more are coming. But so let me go ahead. Do this. Okay, so thank you everybody for joining. Um, today we're going to be talking about Sam Harris's The Moral Landscape. So we're going to talk about um, moral absolutism, consequentialism, and yeah, I think, I think where we'll spend some time is just the degree to which he thought neuroscience would be relevant to these questions 15 years ago and how much that um has advanced our understanding of morality uh since then but um yeah so a few of the central claims that i put down after reading or actually listening are just so first of all and this is something sam says all the time is that everybody is actually a consequentialist and if they think they're not a consequentialist, they just haven't taken a sufficiently broad view of what is encapsulated within consequences. Um, second, he says, the only ultimate consequence that you should care about is how do things affect the welfare of conscious beings? Um, and, you know, like once again, he kind of makes a similar claim where he's like, people think they value other things, but actually... Ultimately, it always comes back to the welfare of some sort of conscious beings and welfare defined in, in some sort of way. So from those two um, claims, he concludes that the moral thing to do, there is an absolutely correct moral thing to do, and it's the thing which will lead to the best consequences in terms of the welfare of conscious beings. And... Therefore, you can compare uh, various moral systems in terms of the degree to which they're successful in creating conditions for human flourishing or for a more general concept of flourishing of conscious beings, depending on what you think of the con like what you think of how conscious other beings are as well and how much their welfare matters relative to humans. Um, and then he goes, okay, so we can compare different systems, which means we can compare different cultures and we can say this culture's system is, this culture's moral framework is superior or inferior to another one's. Um, and while we can do that in theory, he also then goes to the next step, which is, well, science can tell us important facts about the welfare of conscious beings. Um, and so therefore we can learn things about morality from science. Um, and yeah, separately, he also makes the claim that knowing what generates the wealth, welfare for conscious beings is the same as knowing what 
we should care about morally. And he doesn't think we have to make an additional leap to say, these are the facts of the matter, but this is what we're choosing to value and, and promote. Um, and yeah, so I, I think the final part, which I hinted at before, is just he also kind of implicitly or more explicitly claims that at some point, our neuroscience, all, all these different types of scientific things are going to enable us to um, better understand morality and better compare different moral systems. Um, yeah, I think a couple people just joined. So I'll just um, pause for one second. Um, does anybody, did I miss anything from the like highlights of the claims? Hey, Eric. Hey, Mauricio. Thanks for joining. I was just going over sort of the, the central claims of the book, which are everyone's a consequentialist, whether they know it or not. Everyone ultimately only cares about the welfare of conscious beings, whether they know it or not. Therefore, there's absolute moral truth, and you can compare different moral systems for their ability to generate uh, welfare for conscious beings. Science can tell us stuff about the welfare of conscious beings. Therefore, science is relevant to morality. And because no conscious being can claim that they don't want their own conscious experience to be positive. That is like an objective uh, moral good. So yeah, anything I missed before I move on to sort of like some of the questions that we'll discuss as like jumping off points? Okay. If, if I may, I think you should throw some points in there for beliefs. I think that was a big part of his book as well. Yes. Yeah, the belief stuff I, I talk about, um, that's one of the questions I have to, to cover, which is, I think he is implicitly assuming that so long as you believe what's true, you're going to be best set up to maximize welfare, which I think is um, not, not, not as obvious necessarily. Like he doesn't, I don't think he does enough work to support that claim, which he seems to like implicitly have in there. Um, but yeah, so some of the stuff we'll cover is like, is he right about the first two points that the only thing that could possibly matter is the welfare of conscious beings and the consequences of our actions with respect to that? And can we get the fact that we should value the welfare of conscious beings in a moral system from the facts about how the world is uh, directly? Then second, I and this is sort of getting to what Mauricio just brought up, uh, but not not directly, but... I think these are both sort of the same problem, which is, do we actually know what leads to enhanced welfare? Do we actually, like, Sam talks a lot of the time about very specific practices. He'll be like, female genital mutilation is a bad thing because that act leads to these bad things. Um, but, you know, the question could be like, is this part of some grander system of belief which leads to greater fulfillment, meaning, et cetera, that actually does produce higher degrees of welfare. Um, and, and and with respect to the power of belief, it's like what you believe is going to affect what will make you, uh, what will lead to maximizing your welfare and what sort of peak, like what sort of height of peak on the moral landscape to use Sam's language, um, you're able to climb up to possibly. Um, and again, I think that he is, implicitly assuming that believing what's true will most enhance your welfare. And I think he makes some arguments for that, but you know, we also have survey data that shows religious people are happier than, than atheists and things like this. Right. And I'm just not sure how um, responsive Sam would be to empirical evidence, which suggested that holding false beliefs was leading to positive welfare outcomes, uh, for example. And he might talk about that in terms of how things update, et cetera. But anyway, We'll get to that in a little bit. And yeah, the last two things are just like, how much can, you know, he he places this, he makes the whole, we can get an Offerman is theoretically, uh, he argues that like just directly, but then he, he seems to talk a lot about the potential empirical information that we're going to be able to get from neuroscience and other things. And I'm just a little more doubtful about how that would work, um, especially since at the end of the day, we're always mapping things to self-reports from individuals. So I'm a little confused about how neuroscience will directly enable us to like compare welfare across people in a way that we wouldn't be able to otherwise and whether it's made any progress um, since you wrote the book. So yeah, I don't know. Um, and, and also feel free to 
add, I mean, these are just jumping off points to go with, but um, obviously I'm sure there's other questions that I haven't included. So we'll have an open discussion now. Um, feel free to use the, the hand raise uh, option if you are waiting to talk and somebody else is talking, but other, like if it's quiet, you can also just jump right in. So don't feel shy at all. Um, and if you prefer to just listen, that's fine too. Um, but yeah, so starting out, do, so I think the way this kind of brings us back last time we were talking about free will and the way that Sam Harris defines free will is almost tautological. And he does the same sort of thing with consequentialism. So he's like, at some point, you have to care about consequences for something, which I, I mean, I think that is true, but I think, uh, I can't remember who was interviewing him and pushed back and was like, well, that's not a very useful definition be because it's going to, by definition, include everyone. And the, the interesting way of thinking about, are you a consequentialist is, do you actually, um, try to like tabulate up consequences when deciding what to do morally or do you like if you're if you're in practice using a bunch of rules and that's your moral system and yes in some broad way you think it ties back to consequences does that is that a useful definition is that a useful way of like separating out different types of people and different types of uh, moral systems um mike go ahead yeah in this uh context is um consequent consequentialism generally synonymous with um with utilitarianism i don't i don't i i mean i think that he i think consequentialism like you can have multiple values and they don't have to map on to individual welfare and and, and things like that like you can be a consequentialist who has a value of aesthetics as well i believe so i don't i don't think so i think it's like such a broad definition that it is hard for me to understand how um, somebody. But, but is but, but, but is he using? Is he using, 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 using uh, I'm hearing echo. I'm hearing echo. I'm hearing echo. Testing. Okay. Yeah. I'm is he using echo. consequentialist to mean you know like the best outcome for the greatest number of people? Because if so, I would think that is pretty utilitarian. I'd like to re respond to that if I may, Reagan. Yes. Uh, I think consequentialism and utilitarianism are used interchangeably in a lot of contexts, but probably Reagan's right to give Sam some distance there. And I think they're roughly treated the same. There's generally like big three is consequentialism, deontology, or virtue ethics, where deontology is a focus on rules, virtue ethics is a focus on virtues, and consequentialism is a focus on consequences. So usually those are the big three. And I think utilitarianism is like a special flavor of consequentialism where you focus on utility and utility can be something in particular. And Sam in the book, Moral Landscape, fleshes out well-being or subjective well-being as his version of utility. So I guess he's like a well-being Aryan, which might be a little different than utilitarian, but that's his flavor of consequentialism. Yeah, I think that's right. So I think Sam is a utilitarian. I think utilitarian is part of consequentialism, but assuming utility, whereas like, I think you can care about consequences that don't affect somebody's utility in like a broader version of consequentialism, technically. But I mean, there's another obvious variant that's not utilitarianism, which is that if you care about the good of the German people, for instance, but not the good of everyone, Right. But that, yeah, I mean, so that, yes, exactly. So then you care about the utility of specific people rather than the utility of like all conscious beings or something, but you still have, I think the, the, the general consequentialist thing is you value something, you want to maximize that thing. Everything in your moral system should be set up to maximize the thing that you value, the consequences with respect to the thing that you value. Uh, yeah, I'm just saying it's an example of consequentialism. Sorry, I think sorry, I think I'm sorry. I think, you just, yeah, I don't think it's gonna work. I think we're getting too many issues. I don't know why we didn't have the problem before, but okay, thanks. Sorry, go ahead, Eric. Uh, yeah, I was just saying it's, it's a clear example of of uh, consequentialism or an instance of consequentialism that is inconsistent with utilitarianism. So, just on the question of is consequential utilitarian? Clearly not. 
Right. No, utilitarianism is subset is within co consequentialism contains utilitarianism. And I think I want to build off of Eric's comments there. Some have described Sam Harris as a universalist consequentialist, meaning he does care about universal well-being. And maybe what you're describing there, we could call nationalist uh, consequentialist. Maybe it's someone who cares about what happens to their nation state, but doesn't care about the consequence outside of it. And maybe a lot of people by default would be tribalist utilitarian, where they have some vague notion of a tribe that includes maybe their family, maybe people in their city or group. So, you know, I think those could be further ways of flavoring. Um, and I think Sam has been called, or maybe someone described him as a universalist uh, consequentialist because he's just constant about well-being for the whole planet. But I know planet. I've heard him talk about um, making exceptions to that, like he, saying you should care about your own kids more than, you know, someone else's kids. Right. But I think he I think he says that that's because when everybody cares about their kids more, the whole world is also better. And it's still couched in universal welfare. Um, Nate, go ahead. No, I was going to say um, the comment you made about the interview or whatever, where I agree that the difference between consequentialism and something like virtue ethics or deontology is mostly about the algorithm that you're running in your head when making a decision. So like it's kind of cheating to me to say like, oh, like, how do you not like good consequences? I'm just for good consequences when like the argument is more over like, how should you make the decision of what's going to end up with good consequences? And people have all sorts of names like rule utilitarianism or whatever um, in order to specify their decision-making criteria. Um, and uh, so I think he's, being a bit disingenuous on uh, saying that everyone's a consequentialist because um, I think that should mean um, something about the way you're thinking and the algorithm you're running on making decisions. Yeah, and Baish texted me, it was Russ Roberts uh, who, who said that, or, or who gave that pushback. But um, yeah, I, I do think the way he's defined it is so so encompassing that yeah it just becomes useless at that point i mean i think it's fine to to make the clarification at the outset but um it doesn't mean that the other um terms that we've come up with to describe ways of like doing moral calculations or just making moral decisions aren't useful uh still um once i'm just letting somebody enter um okay so so yeah so that was my first uh bit and then you know, the second the second assumption that he thinks everyone sort of has to hold or can't help but hold um, is that the welfare of conscious beings, positive states of experience are the only possible ultimate source of value. Um, so he talks about, you know, religious people who claim to really care about doing what God wants or something as an end in itself, for example, or, or various other things, or they care about keeping things religiously pure or whatever. When you follow the, the reasoning down enough steps, eventually it does come back to how it affects the welfare of humans in, in some way, whether it's like they're in their afterlife or in the um, judgment day or, or what have you. Um, and yeah, so I, I don't know. First, does everybody, does anybody think that he should be so confident, like, do we agree that he should be so confident in saying that this is the only ultimate source of value and no one can really conceivably value other things? I think that's false. Um, I think Spencer Greenberg at Clearer Thinking uh, does an intrinsic values test where he asks people, like, would you value this even if, uh, you know, it didn't cause any other good? And people do have several other different um, things that they value from beauty to truth to uh, like freedom or autonomy um, or whatever that like don't uh, like kind of end up in well-being. Um, so I think Sam's very uh, like I would like it if he instead of saying this is the objective right thing saying this is a a, a good way of like saying what's moral this is a good way to form a moral system uh, and here is me trying to convince you like that you should use this rather than um, 
spending a bunch of time trying to say like, no, like it's objective. Like this is the only thing that can. Um, and I think the, the clear thinking intrinsic values test kind of bears that out. That's empirically false. Yeah. I think, I wonder if it's like, you could, you could, you could, um, maybe his argument would be like, listen, we're evolved to care about all these different things, but we evolved those intuitions because they led to good consequences for our ancestors or whatever. Um, but you don't actually, even though you have the intuition that you value that thing in and of itself, you actually only have that intuition because that having that intuition was like helpful for consequences that did end up going, uh, did end up cashing out in, in welfare is what I'm trying to say. Um, I think that's probably the explanation of the implicit value stuff. But I, I think, I think Sam would, yeah, I don't know. He, he's really, uh, stubborn on this type of question where he'll be like, well, they, they haven't included this in the consequences or they haven't taken as broad of a, a view as I would have, or they, you know, they're miss, they're not counting the fact that it makes them feel good to have agency. So even if they make all these bad decisions that hurt them, they're still happier to just have agency or, uh, you know, so I think, I think he would still argue with that, but yeah. So I think lots of people do actually value things other than the consequences. I think that that's probably true true and whether they came up with those values because of some evolutionary process or not doesn't mean that they don't actually hold those values um do you guys think that this is the only thing anyone should ultimately value keenan go ahead i guess i'm i'm i would say i'm in the of the view that if you offer something that you should value instead of well-being, it's it still seems like an appeal to well-being. And so I, I generally think that the uh, like this framework of of maximizing well-being is basically been the ethical north star of all moral systems, with the exception of radical relativism. Um, but Nate, I guess I uh, I want to hear more from you on the. I guess what you said about the intrinsic value test. And so I guess like what is what you were saying there is that there's there's instances where people value things despite the fact that it doesn't necessarily maximize well-being. Um, so somebody did a test where they try and explain like what an intrinsic value is, something that you value for itself, even if it doesn't mean anything else. And like then give them a test and say, do you value this? Uh, and they answer yes for a, a number of different things. There are things that are more common. And I think like well-being is probably up there um, on things that people value. Um, but at least in self-reports, uh, after being explained uh, the concept, people do in fact still say that they value other things. Like, would you want to know uh, the truth of a situation, whether your friend was always lying to you or something, even if it hurt your feelings sort of thing, where um, like... Uh, the, the, the knowing the truth is a value of itself, even if like you would be better off not knowing. Uh, I, well, I guess he, the way he would probably push back on that is to say that there's certain peaks on the moral landscape that can only be reached after you've crossed a valley. And so I guess like the honesty and even if it hurts your feelings, uh, it's still worth it in the long run. And, um, and like, I think you can kind of come up with like those explanations or whatever, but I think you really start to get into unfalsifiable um, at a certain point, like saying like, oh, but it could be this. And like, um, I don't know, I'm more inclined to, uh, you know, attempt to explain things to people and then like ask them if they in fact value it and um you know, put some stock, maybe not 100% stock, uh, but put some stock in those self-reports. Um, just because I don't know of any thing that would be better than that. And it definitely seems better than just telling them what they value. I, th I think hey, there's, I, there's, sorry, there's I just a distinction gonna... I've just oh, been itching to make here, which is that uh, there's, there's the question of, is everyone a consequentialist, which is different from the que question, is consequentialism right? And, and I think Sam puts maybe a little too much emphasis on that, is everyone a consequentialist? I think it's pretty straightforward just to look at certain religious people and say, 
they really, they have a set of rules and they live all of their lives. They live, they live their lives based solely about adherence to those rules. Um, and, you, you know, it, it, it's kind of silly to, to not view that as uh, deontological, but it, it, none of his argument hinges on, none of his bigger argument for the objectivity of values hinges on the idea that um, everyone has to be right about this. There are plenty of people who can just be wrong and they're, they're living by, you know, according to a, a moral system that's just wrong. I mean, he, which in other contexts, he acknowledges all the time. I, I kind of agree with Sam, actually, that everyone is a consequentialist, even um, the religious people. Uh, but and I, I but but I also agree that it's not a useful conversation because, yes, if that's the case, then it's not useful anyway. But what I what I think is interesting here is like to Nate's point and, and to Eric's point, no matter what people report, he's going to say they are wrong, that they are not a consequentialist or, or whatever. Um which is unfalsifiable, which I find interesting because this book is very much about like, we can learn about morality empirically. And I am struggling to see where Sam touches anything empirical like throughout the book. So I think that's something we'll we'll touch on more. Shine, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask about the, um, the claim that conscious experience is the only source of value. We talked about how somebody might want to learn the truth, even if it hurts them, but the definition of well-being could also be like capacious enough to accommodate that, even if it's not cashed out in happiness. What I'd be interested in is like, if somebody wants to say, leave a planet in another solar system alone, like not harvest it for resources or something, even if there's nothing alive on it for its own sake. Like, that's how I think of that question. Uh, and I wonder if like, if there's a significant amount of humans might buy into a moral system like that. Uh, I'd like to respond to that. Oh, yeah, sorry. Go ahead, whoever. Keenan, was that Keenan or Nate? Horatio is what who unmuted. What might be oh, confusing okay, is okay, yeah. I'll raise and lower the hand. Sorry, I, I saw think... a hand and then I saw a voice and I was like, are these the same person or not? Okay, sorry. Go ahead, Horatio. I think I um, when I use both the Zoom UI, like, moves my tile up and down. I think that might be some of it, but learn all sorts of things today. Anyway, I think Shine asked a really good question or raised some really good ideas there where um, I personally really believe in integral theory or spiral dynamics. And I think your questions lead into that very nicely where uh, use that example. Would you want to know about a friend cheating you even if uh, you'd be better off not knowing? Like this question of better off not knowing is... You know, it, there's some assumptions baked into that. Would I want to not know over the time scale today or a week or a month or a year? So if I was like about to do something really important with this person in the next 10 minutes, I'd be better off not knowing because I need my mind focused. But if I'm going to hang out with this person for a year, I want to know to improve the year long relationship. So there's apparently a time scale there. And people who say like, I want to know, I want to know on questions like that inherently value long time scales they value like i want to know truth because truth helps you forever and i want to know a university degree because the degree helps me forever so people on that scale who say like i want to know even if it hurts or if it goes against my self-interest usually value really long time scales and really long consequences so uh get back to shine's point i do think there is a way to organize people who value really long-term consequences and i think you sniff them out basically through things like the university system. People who care about really long-term consequences do things like dedicate themselves to salons about abstract topics. Yeah, I do think I do think like on the on the lying on the lying thing, the idea that yeah, you're better off. The my pushback on that is always like I don't believe I'd be better off with close people close to me like lying to me about important things because I don't think I don't believe that you can have like the quality of relationships that you can with, with honesty, but that is also like an unfalsifiable belief. Nobody would be able to convince me otherwise. So um, anyway, Christian, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead. Yeah. Great uh, discussion. Can you guys hear me by the way? Yes. Awesome. Um, I'm, I'm thinking about the word of value and how do we ground that down? Like, what does that mean to us? And 
I'm, I'm, I'll just kind of ground it down into the way I tend to think about ethics and morality, which is more about um, what I or we love in life, most of all. Um, and maybe that's a, a, just a synonymous way of talking about things. I value something I or I most deeply love or cherish something, whatever. Um, but but if you maybe it's easier if you kind of semantically move over to the word love to then um, challenge consequentialism uh, as like the ultimate uh, moral compass. Because if, you know, if I love truth, if that's like an intrinsic value or an intrinsic love, um, and I love beauty, uh, these things don't necessarily cash out in terms of, of consequence or the future. Um, and so, but that, but that doesn't change the fact that I deeply love something, right? Like the, in fact, I think you, you could say that my love for life, for reality, for conscious experience, whatever, is part of why people intrinsically value truth. Um, it's because knowing reality is 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 engaging with reality. It's uh, uh, in, in um, Genesis, uh, they say when Adam knew Eve, knew is a, a, a certain kind of intimate knowledge, not just a theoretical knowledge, right? So in that way, like, Valuing truth is this very like love based thing where um, I value truth because I love life and knowing life better, i.e., having a deeper understanding of truth, is a is a um, an outcome of my love and a reinforcement of my love and expression of my love, um, and and that is not necessarily tied to. I mean, I don't think it's completely distinct from, but it is at least an expansion of consequentialism. But would you not say, Christian, that like when you're experiencing the the feeling of loving truth or or whatever, that is a conscious, like a positive conscious experience, which would be a consequence, which Sam would, you know, count in the calculus, so to speak. So I, I don't know. I do think I do think, you know, you're bringing up the point that lots of people do not feel that they are consequentialists. And I think one of the things that I think is interesting is like when you were talking about valuing truth, Sam also, you know, values truth in a way that feels very direct. And while I think he would always couch his defense of that value in this like conscious experience calculus way, um, that's one of the things I want to talk about with the book is like, I don't know that I'm clear on how Sam is, um, determining that truth is is something that is such a good proxy for welfare that he's willing to like make a career on telling people not to believe based on faith um so yeah i, I don't know i i just i i do i do just wonder though if like if there were no humans around to value the truth or if like there were no people around to love whatever thing that you value would it still have the value? I think that's kind of the point, the second point that he's making, which is at some point, people need to consciously experience the thing for it to have value. Um, anyway, I know I was rambling a little bit. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Does anybody yeah. else want to? Yeah, go ahead, Christian. I'll, I'll, I'll quickly follow up. I, I do think, well, the, just the question I think is a bit tricky. Consciousness experience is the only ultimate source of value. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's a, uh, uh, the question of consciousness, it's hard to get outside of it. Right. Um, what can we talk about outside of the context of our own conscious experience? We can kind of try to talk and, and Sam does this sometimes he tries to, um, evoke like a, a disembodied third person, like truly objective way of looking at things. But I deeply question that that's a legitimate way to, to talk about anything. So I, in some sense, I'd say you can't escape the question of everything being or that consciousness is the source of everything including values including love and, and maybe you could even say like there's some type of synonymity uh, uh, uh love and consciousness might be synonymous in some way um uh, can i anyway. jump in uh yes go ahead mike yeah so i think um value is inherently dependent on conscious experience but it doesn't necessarily uh have to be 
your own because there are parents, you know, who would like take a bullet for their kids and they're doing that because they value, you know, uh, their loved one's conscious experience more than their own. So I do think, you know, nothing is inherently valuable. Um, and most people would agree, nothing is inherently valuable unless it can be consciously experienced. But, you know, you may not always prioritize it being, you know, you being the one who's consciously experiencing it. Yeah. Um, Keenan, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I guess, um, well, I guess I'm reminded of this one thought experiment that Sam has, uh, which is, what are the ethical obligations that govern a, a, some parallel universe composed of only rocks? And uh, his assertion is that there are none. Uh, and so I guess I guess the corollary of that is that uh, nothing has value unless there's a conscious, unless it affects some conscious being. Yeah, I mean, it does. I, I have to say my intuition is it's it's very hard for me to understand how you would have moral concerns without conscious beings. And so given that, I do think that strengthens Sam's argument that at the end of the day, it all comes down to welfare of conscious beings. But um, yeah, does Christian, do you have any pushback on that? Or like, yeah, like if there were no humans, like would there be morality? Or do you, would you understand that as a possible world? Yeah, yeah, it's it's the second thing. I don't understand it as a possible world because the concept of a world of only rocks is just something I am imagining in my conscious experience. Hence, I don't really have something I can say meaningfully because I am not escaping consciousness just by imagining some scenario where there's no beings that I associate with having conscious experiences. But I mean, I think the point that's more being driven out at there is that um, when I look at a rock, does that rock have some type of intrinsic moral value system in its rockness? No, I don't. I don't think so. Um, but at the same time, I, I also can't. It's um, totally separate from my own conscious experience. And, and then that can get you into metaphysical conversation about, you know, um, how panpsychism or something like that. So is this all the mind of God or who knows what is this made out of love is this all it's everything conscious and so on Mauricio, go ahead and then we'll um move to the next slide probably unless we yeah go ahead sure thank you i wanted to respond to some of what christian said there i think he came to the right conclusion uh i think you are supposed to conclude that it doesn't make sense to imagine morality in a world without consciousness it just feels illogical and it, it really is and in this book sam are described his method as trying to argue from first principles. And I think this is one of his first principles is that the universe of conscious beings is the universe, that that's a principled place to establish it as opposed to some physical universe, like saying the universe is everything in the radius of 13 light years. He's saying a more principled place to start it is the universe is conscious beings. And if there were no conscious beings, there would be no universe. And where there is consciousness, there is morality. And that's a good starting place. And although I don't want to say too much more here to give people to spread it around a little bit, but I like where you're going with trying to compare and contrast love for well-being. I think both of those are pretty good names for the core unit of consequentialism. You know, some people say utility, but that one feels pretty like cold and dry. So I think love is another synonym to contrast there. And I bet you could plug it in and get all the same conclusions. You could compare and contrast all religions in terms of how effectively they achieve well-being. You can compare and contrast them in terms of how effectively they achieve love. I think that's a perfectly fine starting point, a good atom to put in your theory of molecules. Yeah, I was just going to say that this brings up like what uh, what leads to good welfare or not. Um, Mike, go ahead. And then Christian, I'll let you respond to before we go to the next one. Yeah, so, um, but I did think of a thought experiment, and hopefully this isn't, you know, too much of a tangent or anything, but a thought experiment where um, there isn't any, you know, conscious life, but there could still be morality when, um, let's say, you're the last person alive on Earth, and everyone else is dead, 
and you have some sort of, um, you know, technology that could allow you to um, find the potential for life to go on in some way. Like there's some way that you can repopulate the planet. And in that case, like there's nothing currently uh, conscious other than yourself, but you know, there's still, it could be argued, there's still a moral imperative to do something um, with all the non-consciousness in order to create the potential for more consciousness. Yes, but you're still valuing things on the basis of well, well-being of uh, conscious creatures. In that, like the more the the moral decision still turns on how it affects the well-being of conscious creatures. In that example, whether there exists like future or you know, including non-existing yet creatures. Um, Christian, go ahead. Yeah, uh, responding to um, I think it was shine. Sorry, the the things are very small on my screen, so I'm having a hard time knowing who's. I think who's it, I think it was uh, Mauricio, but Mauricio, anyway. that's right, that's right. Thank you. Um, so while I, I think I agree with like the take that Mauricio describing, I don't know that that's Sam Harris's take. Um, I believe I might be wrong, but I believe I remember reading on his website on one of these episodes because I was brushing up on on his landscape theory uh, over the last week. And I, I think he kind of put out this aphorism that something, 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 but it starts with um, uh, the laws of nature create consciousness. Um, so I, I don't know. I'm not saying I know it's not true, but I don't know that he um, kind of is an idealist in the sense that it's like he's consciousness first. He might be a materialist um, or, you know, an emergentist or whatever. Um, but, and then kind of related is, I, I I do think that at the end of the day, you, you could um, replace the notion of well-being with love, but I, I don't think you just could. I think you should, <laughs> if, if we could get moralistic for a second, um, or at least I think it's consequential, which word you use, because if you use the word well-being, I, I at least think it's a lot easier at that point to um, approach it from a, a kind of measurable uh, thing like you know is my are my is my brain in a state of well being is my you know can I measure my mood right now or or it, it, I think it's and and Sam I think makes this argument and it's that you know you, if you maximize conscious well being that's the greatest good so um, if you could have like a million cows instead of a hundred thousand that's a more ethical thing to have because it's more consciousness uh, presuming that those cows are living happy lives. Um, and so in, in Sam's world, there, there seems to be like this way you measure well-being or that you could at least measure well-being. Whereas when I we talk about love, I think it's, we at least have the intuition that it's a little more mysterious. Um, I mean, we have to use poetry more when we talk about love. We don't like use, oh, man, I, really, I love you like an hour. You know, it's, it's not... Anyways, I just think it might be consequential, even if they are like technically interchangeable terms, because I, I think we would tend not to want to reduce love to, to uh, an external objective type of metric. I think that this kind of brings us into the next thing, which is like, can you get an off from an is or whatever? And I think that Christian, I think, yes, Sam is trying to reduce the mystery around morality. I think that's the whole point of the project is like people typically talk in the terms kind of that you're talking like you can't compare two moral systems you can't compare values people have different values those values are not always uh like uh, the same uh, at base and yet and he is saying no actually there are better and worse ways to live the way that you determine which one is better requires some sort of measurement because otherwise, how are you going to be able to judge which is better than the other? Whether, yeah, I do think there's good questions around like, can you really compare suffering and like the the, the high ends of welfare and how do you um, calculate different types of welfare and, and all of this stuff? Like, I, I don't think it's like easy to say um, 
practically how you would actually measure those things, which is what I find interesting about him saying science will somehow help us with this in mm -hmm. the future. But I do think the whole point, like what he's trying to do is say, how could we make the case that, you know, let's say us in the West with our uh, more or less um, enlightenment values worldview, how can we be confident going and telling other people that, you know, our worldview is, is better than, than theirs? And he feels that the value, the moral value of welfare is something that arises from the facts of the matter. So yeah, so maybe we can just start with reacting to that. Do you guys, first of all, I think Sam worries so much about this personally, I feel like he should just say, I think the right thing to value is is the welfare of conscious beings, and it's confusing to me how anyone else could could value other things. I don't know why. Like I remember he had the podcast years ago with Sean Carroll, and they spent like an hour and a half just arguing about this. And it was like Sean Carroll was like, "No, I 100% agree with you on everything. I'm just saying you have to make this additional step of saying, well, I value the good thing, and I don't value the bad thing." Um, and there could be people who, who, who don't value the good thing or, or whatever. So yeah, so reactions to Sam saying um, you can get an op from an is, essentially. Uh, Keenan, go ahead. Um, well, I guess, I, I think you can still make objective truths about morality, even if you can't, even if you don't have a good answer for why you should value well-being, just as you can say that, um, you can make scientific and just as you can be scientific about medicine, even though you can't give some scientific reason that you should value good health. Um, but once you grant that as an axiom, now this, this entire science of morality is possible. Yeah, I agree um, with that. I, I don't see the reason for like questioning whether you have to, like Sam is like, no, this is not, basically I remember he had this long debate where he was, all Sean Carroll was saying is you're adding one additional axiom. You're, you, the first axiom is that your observations of the world can generate truth about or, or can, can reveal truth. Um, there's a correspondence between how, how we perceive the world and the world as it actually is that allows us to build knowledge over time and that we should value you know, the, the conscious experience or the welfare of conscious beings. And yeah, anyway, I, I, I think that to your point, once you've said we value that, then you can objectively compare things on that basis. Um, whether it is or is not directly arising from the facts seems to me a irrelevant question, but I, I, I don't agree with Sam on, on this one. I think that you do have to take on an additional axiom of deciding that you value human welfare. Um, but yeah, I don't know if anyone else, it, does anybody agree with Sam? <laughs> yeah, I agree with him. Um, and I, I think it would be a little tough. I, I think it is a very big question. Like I, I agree with his ultimate conclusion. I don't necessarily agree with his particular arguments for it, but I, I guess what I want to do is just spend a minute to, to say why it matters because your, your position seems to be, it doesn't really matter to say this yeah. is your, this is what you value. And I think the reason is, I mean, the the entire cultural progression that led into kind of the modern, po the, the the contemporary postmodern crisis of uh, just institutions being attacked, of there being just rampant skepticism of the whole kind of liberal order. Um, it, you know, there's this idea that it just came out of nowhere in the 1960s, and and I, I don't really think that's the case. I think there was a long intellectual progression from the end of the enlightenment to these things which kind of reached their height in the 1960s and became very acidic on the rest of society and, and just melted things away. But I think there was this clear progression and in the early 1900s, there was a, a, a very sharp element of this in those who basically wanted to renounce the age old philosophical quest of trying to ground moral values in objective facts. And so you had these you know emotivist uh, kind of theories of morality that that when when I make a moral statement, all that expresses is my preference. It doesn't even it, it doesn't even rise to the level of having any kind of 
um, you know, th there's there's no even claim to objectivity there. You, you can't even make a, a claim about the factual world when you utter a moral statement. And, and there was a, a pretty clear line between that and what ultimately happened in the 60s. And I think Sam correctly views, uh, you know, you can't just unwind Foucault in the 1960s and kind of dial it back to 1959 and say, let's just advance from there. There were some real problems that people started taking wrong turns on before that. And he views that I'm kind of a, a, a little bit, maybe I'm projecting onto him a little bit, but this is this is what I view. And, and I think if you don't answer these questions, it's it's very likely you'll wind up in the same skeptical place the postmodernists did. And so yeah. even this is not a proof that he's right. This is just to say that there's value in looking at this question because a lot seems to, to kind of hang on. No, I think what you ultimately value and what you believe about the world, which would affect how you think you should um, achieve those values matters for sure. But I don't think it matters whether... So like, I think that I actually think the argument is stronger to say you all already value human or conscious welfare above everything else. And maybe you only think human human consciousness matters or whatever. But I think that I think that's an easier argument to make than the facts of the matter tell us to value conscious uh, the welfare of conscious beings. I think it's I think it's an easier argument to say you already you already ultimately value that and all the and you all you ultimately value how the consequences of various decisions play out with respect to that. Uh, but yeah, M Mauricio, I guess go what ahead. I'm saying is oh, maybe yeah, sorry, that is ahead. easier. Maybe that is yeah. easier. But like my my claim is that if everyone comes of the opinion that there is no objective basis for morality, kind of like the intellectual Western intellectual world was in the early 1900s, there is a clear progression into postmodern skepticism that you're not going to be able to ward off. So. Like it may be the case that all like the, you know, woke activists or whatever, they claim at least to, you know, value human beings in, in, in some way. And you, you could kind of come, you could argue with them by starting off at that common point. But the, the statement I'm trying to make is, is that this whole intellectual progression happened, it was kind of sparked uh, in part by, um, by this crisis that came about because people basically gave up on the idea of answering the question of how to ground moral values. Um, uh, I, don't, I don't know if that's that convincing. I want to build on yeah. that. I, I Yeah, go ahead. I actually agree with your take. Uh, I don't think you're projecting it onto Sam. I've followed him for a long time, both through his podcast and some of his books. And so we know that he's read like Derek Parfit and he had... Uh, his own history of philosophy and such. So I do think Sam thinks in those terms that philosophy has a history to it and there was the enlightenment and then there was a counter revolution of values. And so I think he thinks in those terms. So I don't think you're projecting that. So, although I can't say he specifically like predicted wokeism or postmodernism, you know, he, he went to college, he was a PhD. He probably saw an evolution of attitudes in academia and, and also I know a little bit about his beliefs in pragmatic Buddhism, where there are certain ideas like, if you want to change the world, maybe you lay out your arguments in a certain way that makes a lot of sense for the time period and people will find it convincing. So I think that that's where this book is very, very interesting to me, is this book has a lot of factual points, like the specifics of neuroscience and the specifics of religion, the specifics of beliefs. But if you kind of squint a little bit, this book is a really good post 1960s book. Uh, the sentences are like nice and pleasant. I can hear Sam's voice reading them. It's like a nonchalant attitude. There's nothing scary about religion. There's nothing scary about faith. So people in the 1960s, maybe, you know, their advice would have been truth is in linguistics. Go read 10 books about that. So it's very radical in attitude of Sam to say, no, go look in neuroscience. The truth is in neuroscience. Go read 10 books about that. And what you come away from there will be closer to a workable theory of well-being. So just his attitude and his nonchalant way of asking questions and kind of joking around, exploring even exotic, truthful ideas. Uh, I agree with what you're saying there. It's a very post-1960s way of thinking. It's a very post-postmodern 
way of thinking. It's, it's actually workable. It's calm. It's not aggressive or guilt laden. So uh, that's one way I think the book is very valuable too, in terms of that history. Yeah, I just think he really over promises what neuroscience can deliver, which we'll talk about next, but, um, uh, or, or not necessarily next, but soon. Nate, uh, go ahead. I saw you had your hand up. Uh, so like Sam really wants morality to be like science and that you can say what's right and wrong. Um, I think science, uh, or things that science studies, uh, the physical world, um, is like the thing that that like can cash out in, um, like the physical world reality, um, that is a shared experience, um, is the like thing that that can cash out in that makes you be able to say whether something was right or wrong, whether or not gravity exists. Like you can just do an experiment where like I drop the thing and it goes down, right? Like that's that's a repeatable thing that you can do. Uh, I don't really think that there's anything that you can like ultimately say like this here, I'm showing that this is the correct thing and an ultimate thing in which morality cashes out in. It's just like, this, I think this is good. And I'm trying to like project that onto whatever you, un the universe society or whatever, but there's just no ultimate like hashing out in the way that there is with science, with like the, the interaction with the physical world. Um, morally right doesn't have um, a like uh, an ultimate hash out in the, in that way. Um, and like you were saying with Sean Carroll or whatever, like, yeah, it's, it's another step to say like, okay, you can do that for like well-being, but then you have to say well-being, doing things that are good for well-being is right morally. Um, and it's just that extra step. I think that people, um, that, that he wants to do this, uh, because it's, uh, you want to shy away from saying like, I want the world to be the way I want it to be. Yeah. Um, there's like a selfish vibe or whatever to that. Um, but like, I think that ultimately I would just own that and be like, yeah, I want to make the world the way I want it. And part of that is considering everyone else's well-being and opinions and that the way I want the world is for everyone to be good. Mm -hmm. Um, and so like, uh, I'm willing to, to do things to, you know, um, coordinate with other people that if they're, if people are doing things that are enough against that and that enough of us agree that, that it's against that, we can arrest them and like restrict their freedom and do, um, kind of, uh, like build a coalition around the things that we do in fact agree on are good, um, uh, to like, I guess, act on that, you know, moral rightness, wh whereas like, the, the people that you can tell he really doesn't like or just want to shrug and be like, ah, but like, you know, that's the way they do it. Uh, so it's fine. Like I'm, uh, I want to resolve his problem by just saying like, I don't like that. I want it to be different. Uh, I think that enough people are going to agree with me and that we want it to be this way that we're going to coordinate and like gang up on the minority of people who think that, you know, in a Brian Kaplan sense, they must actually want to murder that person more than they don't want to go to jail sort of thing. So like, um, whatever sense, uh, yeah, like, so I, I don't think you can get, uh, like an objective moral right answer because there's just no, um, ultimate answer to that in the way that there's the physical world. And I think that, uh, be, being selfish and owning that like I'm going to try and make the world the way I want it to be is the way to cut through the um like not being able to say what's objectively moral or not standing up for yourself or your own opinions yeah I know the Kaplan thing gets at a lot of it too because it's like I think when people are doing the cultural relativist thing they're like well these people seem happy they wouldn't like voluntarily lose all of their beliefs and lose all the things that they think are important to them but that's still not to say that they wouldn't be better off or wouldn't have like a higher potential fulfillment in life. They had a different set of beliefs or a different set of conditions or whatever. And like, same with the Kaplan thing. It's like, sure. If you want to phrase it that way, somebody really wanted to do the thing that they would not have done had they taken medications for it or, or something, but they can still 
they can still predict like I'll be a better off person overall if I want different things. Um, and that's like the layer that is on top of the, you know, just fulfilling preferences or whatever. Um, Christian, go ahead. Yeah, um, I'm glad Nate was able to make at least one of my major points for me with a, a lot of uh, comprehensiveness. I, I totally agree that a lot of the motivation for trying to um, like overcome that you can't derive an from an is is these these kind of like cultural battles about being able to have the authority to say something is bad and oh no moral subjectivity or relativism has taken that away so I need to develop a a you know, scientifically based um, justification for my morality. And, and not only do I disagree with that for all the reasons that many people have said and, and say in previous conversations with Sam, um, but I, I agree with Nate that there's better solutions um, and, and more kind of common sense solutions, which is learn to be comfortable simply disagreeing and also um, understand that you or anyone else might feel so strongly in their preferences that they'd be willing to set boundaries. And those boundaries are can be at very, uh, various uh, scopes of extremity, anything from I'm gonna walk out of the room to I'll uh, put you in handcuffs. Um, so like to me, it, it's just not a problem if someone asks the question, well, what if this person who's about to kill your family to make it like a more easy straw man, uh, what if this person who's about to kill your family believes it's morally right for him to kill your family? Well, I don't care. I'm going to stop him. And if I need to, I might kill the guy. Um, that's, I, I think, not a, a very, I, I don't think that's a position that needs to be defended, but we feel it needs to be defended more in the sociopolitical discourse because we want to kind of like cast these condemnations about, about other cultures and moral systems and religion and all this stuff. And it's just, it's, it's stickier in that, in that realm um, or, or like more fraught in certain ways. And so, Thus, people are motivated to, um, or at least Sam Harris is motivated to, like, overcome the, the obvious distinction. Um, and, and I'll just put, like, two things in there. I've, like, I've thought about this since he wrote that book because I wrote, I submitted an essay. He put it out in an essay contest after he wrote the book saying, if anyone wants to disprove it, you know, write in an essay and I'll pick the best one or something. Anyways, and, and it's just a fascinating question to me. But a few, like, quick uh, little thoughts. Um, one he tries to bolster that you can like be objective about this by appealing to the worst possible suffering for everyone. I just think that's like a non-starter idea to me. It's like, it's just, it's like saying the, the smallest possible number is the way that we measure bigger numbers or something like that. It's just, it's not like a logically coherent idea, or at least I think we should be skeptical of it or it's unfalsifiable. What does that mean? The worst possible, why can't it always be worse? Why can't it be infinitely worse? So um, and then the other one that I like is like the Alan Watts uh, uh, little quip where he says, you know, like, um, if you were God, you would get bored with being God and you would want to like divide your consciousness into a million individual consciousnesses and have the experience of uncertainty. But the price you pay is basically suffering and uncertainty and heartbreak and all this stuff. Um, so I, I think that also maybe like Sam's idea of the moral landscape is like, just try to get as high as possible, but maybe there's like a little bit of a horseshoe theory where like, if you get too high, you're, you're Icarus. And then you're like, fuck, this sucks. Let's go like back down the mountain a little bit um, and have a little more fun with all, maybe we enjoy pain at some like deep metaphysical level. Suffering is, is kind of part of what makes life meaningful. I don't know. Um, I could go on and on about this question, but I'll stop there. Yeah, on the chosen, I think I think the I like Paul Bloom's stuff on on suffering, which which is making the case that we enjoy chosen suffering, but not um, not chosen suffering generally. Um, so, and I think that that's true, and I'm sure we all have like things that we like to do that involve that. But yeah, I I just think in terms of the comparing cultures thing, I I do think the the argument doesn't require making the is odd distinction or, or whatever it really just said like the reality is religions do appeal to their believers on the basis of their eventual welfare it's not just on the basis of the glory of god at least like the major western religions they include a whole afterlife which you're going to be putting into the calculation all the time and the whole point is like 
they can make pretty strict religious rules because the infinite timeline of the afterlife just overwhelms the calculus on ever wanting to break the rules in real life. So like they already agree to all the things Sam says. It's just, if you believe in this infinitely long afterlife, then you're going to come out with very different um, results of calculations when you're, when you're doing them. Um, Mike, go ahead. Yeah. So I just wanted to uh, say that in general, like I agree with uh, Sam's general framework that um, as you guys pointed out, like if we're all in agreement about the, if the axiom that if we believe that, you know, the welfare of conscious beings is the highest priority, then yes, you can get a not from an is, but I just uh, also agree with you and Nate that um, it's very, very hard to execute this practically, especially, um, you know, when it comes to all these moral gray areas uh, and all these, you know, trolley problems we can come up with. Um, because just human emotions and the human brain is just the most complex object in the universe, really. And um, it, it, you can only really entertain Sam's thought experiments when he's dealing with uh, these extremes. And unfortunately, I don't think most of the real world's moral dilemmas, you know, come down to these extremes. Yeah, I think that brings us perfectly into the next thing I want to talk about, which is sort of like, in theory, we can calculate up consequences and how they affect welfare and all of that. How well are we actually able to do that in practice? And what is the basis for Sam's confidence with respect to like our cultural values relative to Islamic cultural values? Um, for just a random example, um, not that he's like interested in that at all. Um so yeah, so and and this also I think is like very relevant right now with sort of the trad right return postmodern left as well. Like I think there's a lot of people who are questioning. Um, sure, we've made progress in all of these ways. Have we like actually made progress on what it is to live a good life? Do we actually have a handle on comparing societies? And I think you can say like I think one one thing in favor of. Um, believing that Western values are actually getting some things right that other countries are still not getting right is the fact that a lot of people want to move here and risk immense uh, personal damages and a lot of money to to do so. So like to me, that's where I'm like, well, I don't know, supply demand seems like I, I do kind of go with, I assume people on average know what's best of them. I, I still get the point that people can have like incorrect values or they can predict incorrectly or, or whatever. But yeah, I, I don't know. Um, so yeah. What do you guys think about that? Do we really know what conditions societally and personally are most likely to lead to increased welfare for conscious beings? And like, how confident should we be that not only can we in theory compare moral systems, but we can in reality right now? Can I take the first shot at that one? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, just lots of great questions. I really enjoyed this conversation and it breaks my heart every single thread that's come up in this hour that we just can't follow through. Um, I think, um, so just your question is how well can we add up and compute values in practice? I think we do it surprisingly well. So, you know, I have a statistics background. So oftentimes you have to like compute a loss function, like a total loss function. And you do that over some very big data set. And there's a lot of analogous stuff that comes up with the kinds of questions Sam wrestles with is um, sometimes it's very computationally expensive to like add up losses over lots and lots of data points. So we come up with tricks like maybe you randomly sample different points or maybe you oversample certain points or maybe you retain some average across batches and you just make updates to the batch. So in terms of our society, like I don't think we regularly poll every American citizen on what they think. We engage through partial update systems like prices. Like I just go and buy something and that's like a partial update to some global objective function. And like, I don't think I regularly 
re-decide the United States Constitution is a good one. I just make like minor updates to a system that's in progress. So I think we're really good at adding up the computing values in practice because we rarely have to do the full computation. And instead, like much of modern life is just tiny updates to these systems. Like one additional dollar was spent on the interintellect.com or, you know, two additional people became citizens this month or something. Yeah, I mean, I guess let me put it another way. So it's like if Sam, you know, thinks that people should believe what's true, he is against faith-based religion, all of this kind of stuff. And he's simultaneously saying that he cares about maximizing welfare and that we can empirically learn about what maximizes welfare and, and try to do that. And yet, you know, there's, I think, Survey data is like pretty clear that, you know, people who are religious have more kids and report greater levels of fulfillment and happiness. And so they're producing more conscious beings that are expected to have higher levels of welfare. So why shouldn't like, where is he getting the confidence to tell everybody to stop being religious from? Where is he getting that confidence? Because it seems to me that he believes in a way that doesn't require any empirical justification that believing what's true is is just better um shine go I, ahead i think that's that's a oh, bit of a here, straw man bit of a oh sorry were you calling on someone else oh i think shine put up his hand but you could, go ahead we'll go to we'll go to shine right after it's fine you already started okay um i mean clearly there is a very clear empirical understanding which we basically all have with a, a you know basic knowledge of history which is that for most of human history, we were doing very, very poorly compared to how the West, the Western world is doing, or the developed world, call it, is, is doing right now. And there's just been this huge exponential growth. And we have a pretty clear understanding of what happened. There was, you know, through the Middle Ages, there was kind of a much slower progression. There was a greater adoption of a kind of, you know, uh, secular ideas, um, kind of more critical, scientific, uh, you know, approach to understanding the world. This kind of culminated in the Enlightenment and then the Industrial Re Revolution, et cetera. And just this basic kind of theory explaining, you know, what's happened to the world that's radically changed it over the last 300 years. Um, if if you, you know, subscribe to that that basic story, it's pretty clear that it was the growth of human knowledge and uh, our understanding things that we hadn't understood before that was the difference between, you know, dying when you're 40 with, uh, you know, half of your teeth still there, um, you know, and working 14 hour days, six, six days a week on the farm. Um, the difference between that and like a modern lifestyle with all the problems we have now and all the pathologies, you know, and, and all the medications we're on, et cetera. It's still such a totally superior form of life uh, compared to like the absolutely kind of just poverty-stricken existence of people for almost all, all human history, I think that basic story is enough empirical justification to say that, yes, let's understand the world more, uh, because there's no reason the exponential curve has to cease right now. Yeah, and I think I think that the the follow-on from where I started is, like, he would say, maybe, maybe something that Keenan brought up before, which is, like, okay, maybe those individuals or even as a society have to go through a couple generations of like dealing with this issue of fulfillment before they come up with new institutions to, to help manage that problem as well. But, um, you know, if we allow everyone to like become more fundamentalist, less interested in, in science and progress, that future generations are going to be so depleted relative to where they would have been if even like even if right now you're better off being religious, I'm saying it could still be that that will put put us on a path where we generate less scientific knowledge progress and that reduces the overall welfare of the of the future generations. Um, Shine, go ahead. Um, sorry so, for the delay. <laughs> uh, no problem. Um, so in the question of like religious people, I think there's some justification for. Um, saying that the data can't doesn't reliably tell you that religious people are happier because that is confined to surveys in like the US or other country, other developed countries. Um, from what I understand, the only thing we have here is self-report of like, how happy are you? And then you try to find correlates like- That's the only thing we have ever, which is what we'll yeah, get into I, next. I Sorry, go ahead, Chang. <laughs> and, and the two typical ways to do it is like sample, how happy are you today? Or how happy were you yesterday? 
or like reflect on your life and rate it on a zero to 10 scale. And depending on how you ask the question, if you ask the happiness question, like a bunch of Latin American countries win. <laughs> if you ask the life satisfaction question, it's pretty much a, 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 like a relative ranking of GDP per capita um, modulo some inequality penalty. Um, and, and that seems to cash out more in terms of like what people actually do. Like I agree with the point about immigration, like if Latin American countries are so happy, why do so many people want to move? So, mm -hmm. so methodologically, there might be something wrong with simply asking about reflections on happiness. Um, and, you know, poorer countries are more religious and the net flow seems to be to less religious countries. So even if you find that cross-sectionally within these richer societies, the religious are more happy, that could be confounded by many other things. It's not clear that religiosity itself is like the causal variable. There might be something about community. Um, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, and, and I agree with the basic story that um, the uptick in health and uh, wealth does seem to be the main correlate of happiness. Um, and you see this even within like rich countries, there's a lot of discourse about like, I don't know, something is making us unhappy, but um, it seems to you that people think other people aren't happy, but if you ask them about their own selves, they are relatively happy. So there's a sort of pluralistic ignorance where you think something is wrong with the world and other people are suffering, uh, even like I'm talking like even within rich countries. But if you take the aggregate and average people about reflecting on their own life, then you expect something. Um, it's like a higher score. So these might simply be um, artifacts of, you know, the way social media algorithms work or something. But uh, the wealth effect is, I think, is huge. And like traditional arguments of um, there's like a saturation after a certain amount of income. I think those have largely fallen. There is diminishing returns, but it seems like more money is better. Uh, there's also genetics, uh, but like when you average over enough people, like that seems to be one of the main drivers. Yeah, I mean, I think that just to be clear, I do think that I I do think we can understand to some degree, which which kind of conditions enhance welfare. And I agree with both of you guys. I was just asking the question, but I, I do, I will admit that when we're talking about, when we're talking about like early agricultural societies, that seems like a huge, huge downgrade from, from current life. I'm like a little bit less clear about like how it would have been as a woman in like hunter gatherer life. I don't know that it would have been like for the median woman, maybe for the median man, I think it was worse, but for the median woman, I think it's like, honestly could, could be other things they didn't have to work very much and, and all of that stuff and like I think they lived a lot longer on average to like in certain places than the men anyway but all the all the childbirth with with no um drugs that part I would have I would like to skip so um anyway Nate go ahead um I know I've heard something uh it was a social psychologist who was a member of the reasonable doubts podcast which would have been like 10 years ago uh, but who did a study on happiness uh, and like found a bit of a U curve um, on like relig religiosity. So like people who were like very religious were happier and then kind of went down as people were like doubting or just like in the nuns, but like back up if you went into like confident atheists. So yeah, um, like if you group everyone in together as nuns or whatever, like you'll get like worse data. But like if people who are confident in their worldview or whatever um and i don't know if that's uh i completely lost my thought um but like it goes back up and it's not necessarily there uh so i was gonna say like i'm very confident that sam's response to that question would be that people are happier despite the religion uh or even like uncorrelated with like being religion and there are other reasons rather than because of the faith in god um things like community or even what um somebody said recently that like immigrant parents are doing uh like much better at like parenting and getting like keeping their kids happy and whatever uh because they're kind of willing to lay down the law and i would expect that to be correlated as well with like religiosity um mm -hmm. and right leaning um you know in america so like there, there are those aspects that can kind of be fudged and say like, oh, that's why uh, religious people are happier. And it's not because of the religion. 
Um, I think that's true, but I think some of those things you still should credit religion with because, okay, so, like, if there's just certain personality types that, like, stay more religious or or it's just, it's heritable or, or whatever, that's a separate effect. If it's, like, the things that give you high hedonic set points that are heritable also correlate with religion, that's one thing. But it's, like, if religion is the only, like, reliable way we figured out to create the community and to create the confidence with, like, holding rules and whatnot, then... To me, it's still, it's like, until we found a secular system that does all those things, religion gets to claim that as its own. Like, we don't have a secular system for, like, reliably building community in a way that we do in religion yet. That I I've that's seen, at least. Other than Sam Harris meetup groups. <laughs> um, <laughs> sorry, uh, Christian, go ahead. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll respond to something you just said, and it's, it's early days to like, obviously to jump into uh, any conclusions about this, but um, I am like waving a little flag for the idea of um, task-based community. Um, Cause I live out here in Southeast rural Arizona. And um, a few years ago I helped kind of jumpstart this decentralized community of neighbors uh, who, um, who get together twice a month and we help each other uh, build things on each other's properties. And we're now just like a big friend group. It's gotten to like 130 people with about 50 people showing up twice a month. Um, and it's, nice. you could, you could make an analogy to church. It's a bunch of people who deeply respect each other, are very chill with each other. We come from a diverse background of political, religious, cultural beliefs and, and identities and all that. Um, but we're, I guess, just united by human decency and needing to get shit done. Um, and, and I, I don't want to, I don't think we should so quickly rule out that um, we can't find community without religion. I think it, it might be we, society gets in the way more than um, religion is, is some kind of like necessity there. Um, but like I said, that's just a kind of aside. I, I think even though, as I said earlier, I don't agree with that you can derive off from this, it actually scares me. I think there's things to worry about if you claim that you can get an off from an is. And so when I think about this, there's like a couple micro and a couple of macro type of examples to illustrate the concerns. Um, one question I always come back to is, all right, say you do develop a system for measuring someone's well-being, and it's like a certain brain state, whatever, like, pattern, let's say, of, of brain activity or something, and we've all decided, you know, science has shown that when a brain is in this state, people report being in a state of well-being, hence we've created this correlation, and we're going to use that as a scientific metric. Um, but to me, it's it's very unfalsifiable, and the, the kind of edge cases that, you know, like when a monk sets themselves on fire in protest, um, but they're just sitting there peacefully, are they suffering, you know? Uh, when when you're afraid that you're gonna get burned, are you stuck? Do you have to suffer when you're actually have a flame to your hand? The example Sam Harris often uses: Do you have to suffer? Could it be like the monk? Um, when some Elon Musk puts something in your brain and like triggers all your suffering uh, neurons or something, do you really have to suffer? Is there can we falsify um, this at all? And I don't know. It just it asks like kind of really hard to answer questions about consciousness and and the nature of suffering at the deepest level. Um, how much of it is materialistic? How much of it is kind of consciousness based? Um, and it, and it can you can see a world where it's a bit Kafka esque, where everyone's telling you that you're suffering, even though you're like I'm not suffering, and they're like, no, all the measurements say you're definitely suffering, and, and we need X, Y, and Z to stop you from because we've created this whole. Um, you know, Sam Harris, more landscape based society and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then the, the kind of like maybe more macro version of, of stress testing this theory uh, that I, I'm actually writing a short story about it for the first time um, is a, a thought experiment where, you know, we're 100 years into the future. We have some um, mega AI that has been like virtuously guiding us through tough civilizational decisions with success for 100 years. It's prevented multiple wars. It's solved a million problems. It's like this, you know, everything that, the, you know, your AI wet dream could possibly be. And then one day it says, oh, guess what? Um, I've, di I've discovered or whatever that um, 
things are going to go really poorly unless you give me complete 100% autonomy to control human civilization. And I need the keys to all the nukes and I need the keys to all this and blah, blah, blah. I just need like total authority over human race. And that's the only way to prevent a, a catastrophe that causes the worst possible suffering for everyone, let's say. Um, and I can't even explain to you like why that is. You just have to trust me. Okay. So we have like a hundred year track record of an AI that's done all these great things. Do we turn over the keys to the kingdom to the AI at that point? Or, or do we have some just kind of like really deep intuition that maybe the AI isn't conscious and isn't conscious and, and maybe there's something about consciousness that we know we have access to, which should have the final say and, and, and thus has some type of moral ethical authority that we can never give fully over to science. Um, so in that, that little, uh, in that, like uh, allegory, the, the massive AI represents like kind of some penultimate expression of our scientific venture. Anyway. Yeah. I mean, just to respond to the, the, the consciousness part and, and the mapping over and, and all of that, that that's kind of what I want to talk about in a bit too, which is just when we're talking, when, when you're mapping brain states to welfare states, that's on the basis of conscious reports from the subjects. So there's no other way to map the brain states. So like the way neuroscience works is they put the person in there and then they look at their brain and then they correlate how they say they're feeling with, with how it looks. And so, yeah, to your point, Christian, if somebody's brain was producing the things that 90% of the time mean good welfare or bad welfare, but you're telling them that it's not, I mean, I do think like the self-report is the only ultimate basis for for this kind of knowledge that said i don't know if like when monks are burning and they're not reacting i wonder if they they're actually able to like not have certain things be firing in terms of like pain centers and stuff i, I don't know what the research is there but i'm pretty sure isn't it true that like long-term meditators actually don't experience those brain states that you would expect under under the same stimulus Anyway, we okay. need to burn a monk in an fMRI to find out. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe not burn him, but maybe just like, like poke him with like a, a pin or something. Um, <laughs> we'll find a find a monk to participate for the glory of science. Uh, anyway, Mauricio, sorry for uh, jumping in ahead of you. No worries, no worries. I want to validate that specific claim and then respond to some of Christian's really good questions. So, yeah, I do think monks who meditate over a really long period of time can start to affect their uh, sensory experience. So just like a really specific, uh, simple example of this technique, Zen Buddhists talk about Zen mind, where first you imagine beginner's mind, and then you imagine master's mind, and then you become Zen mind. And there's a famous book that uses this phrase to play around with it. So in any situation, you can ask yourself, what would a beginner do? A beginner would be clumsy and kind of foolish and ask lots of exploratory questions. Okay, now switch gears. In this situation, what would a master do? A master would know the right answer, the most efficient route to the goal, the right questions to poke and prod people. So some people are just like unintuitively switching between these modes. They don't have conscious control of this. But if you read this book, then you become aware of these two mindsets. And now you are something greater than that. You are someone who can consciously choose to enter into a beginner mindset or enter into a master mindset and you can switch at will to like enjoy your video games more or get through your reading material faster. Like, you know, you become greater than when you can imagine what a, this mind would do, what this mind would do. So some Buddhists do follow this forever. And so they just like simulate the experience of what someone on fire would feel. And then they are something greater than that, that doesn't feel that pain, but you need like 10 years to get to that level. Level one is just like, sometimes be a beginner, sometimes be a master, and you'll experience pretty immediate fruits from that. So there is something there. But if I may, I want to pivot hard and talk about some of Christian's really good points. So uh, I think that's really cool you said about your task-based community. I want to ask lots of questions, but I'll just say that's really cool. I'm glad you were able to share a very practical example of people building a new community of unusually diverse people. Like That's pretty inspiring. Um, you know, you had some good questions about um, you know, how the moral landscape would hold up in the long term? I think those are great questions. So I want to bring like 
two concepts to bear on that. One, I, I think I heard somewhere is called like things separate at the tails. And that writer used a very memorable image. He put up the San Francisco subway map and showed that like in the middle of the city, and I don't, I'm not from the city. So someone from there, maybe will, I'll be wrong here, but in the middle of the city, like five out of six of the subway lines just run parallel. But as you leave the city and go to its outskirts, they start to separate more and more until at the very outskirts, there's only one line that gets there. So basically what I'm saying that is maybe like in modern day America, Christianity and atheism and some kind of moderate wokeism, maybe they live in parallel. But if you follow all these theories out to their extremes, they start to diverge greatly. And like the heaven of Christianity starts to look very different than the heaven of moral landscape, which looks very different than the heaven of modern wokeism. So maybe here in modern America, these philosophies kind of run in parallel and they mainly agree with each other and they mainly would rank order the same actions like take care of your body, go to school and love your loved ones. But as you go out to the extremes, moral theories diverge greatly and will advocate very different things to do in 200 years from now, or there's a 100% perfect AI, or, you know, they start to diverge greatly. So with that in mind, I think the moral landscape is a really good theory for this era of the 2000s, and maybe someone in their 20s, because you can spark a lot of curiosity in a young person in their 20s with the moral landscape. Just the idea that there is a landscape and you don't have to care about the opposite end of the landscape. You just have to care about your current point and your best gradient ascent. So that's a really useful attitude. And if the moral landscape as a theory doesn't hold up 200 years from now, like that's okay as long as in our current point on the landscape, discussing these theories takes us to a better point of maybe more people engaging with questions of morality or more people standing up to people who hold bad values. Like having the theory in the year 2024 could be a really good way to take one step forward on the landscape, even if you ask really good questions about where it would take us 200 years from now. So kind of my thoughts. Yeah. Yeah. I do think, I do think part of the the question is like, yeah, what, and this gets to what Eric was talking about, about like the uh, historical se sense of what, whatever will, and this is more how I'm thinking lately is just like, whatever will lead to the most progress is the moral thing because of the length of time out in front of us. Um, go ahead, Eric. Oh, you're muted. Um, I just want to get back to the idea that uh, uh, on this question of how can we measure conscious states and the only thing we have is self-report, you can kind of say, say the same thing the same about thing medical. About... Sorry? Oh, that was just some feedback. Um, you could kind of say the same thing about uh, uh, medical problems or human health, you know, 2000 years ago. There was no objective way to tell if someone had cancer. You just have to ask them, of, oh, do you, does your abdomen, are you experiencing pain in your abdomen and these kinds of things? And of course, the only way we actually bootstrapped ourselves to get to the point where we understood what cancer is and but what to look for and stuff is that we started off with self-report and, you know, um, medicine had this, you know, very quick uh, kind of cycle of progress much later than 2000 years ago, where we bootstrapped our way up, up to understanding the, the infernal structures, which caused cancer. And in, in the same way that once, and, and we're pro probably very far off from this neuroscientifically, but once we get to that point, um, you know, it's not going to be just self-report. It's going to be our understanding of those physical structures that we, through self-report, through the most primitive kind of early attempts at understanding these structures, we bootstrapped ourselves up to that understanding of what those structures, you know, neuro uh, structures were um, through self-report. But ultimately, we'll have better theories of all of that stuff, and we'll have more than just self-report. Um, and and maybe a, a, another analogy works here, which is that. For most animals, especially much more microscopic or less complicated animals, the, the analog of the human's overall well-being is just the physical health of the organism, right? The, the, and in a certain sense, well-being is just the physical health of your brain in some way. But, but if you're talking about just like a bacterium, you know, there are 
pretty clear ways to tell what's a healthy bacterium and not a healthy bacterium. And we didn't even need self-report because we don't talk to the bacteria, right? There, there are pretty obvious ways to tell what is a physically healthy animal. Like, does it have all its limbs? Does it have big, you know, scars on it? Is it, is it, is it bleeding? Um, and uh, like, th there's no reason to think in principle, we won't get to that same kind of objective way of measuring the, the psychological, uh, uh, neurological state of human beings. It's just that we can't even imagine what those theories are that would help explain that now because they're so far off of our current understanding of it. But I, I, I think it's just overly pessimistic to this. I think there's more to it than that though. Cause okay, so when we're, is, the objective here is maximizing welfare. The gold standard for your welfare is, has got to be self-report. It could be that we scientifically realize that there are times where somebody self-reports that they're feeling really mentally good, but we can tell based on their brain systems that they're fooling themselves or lying to themselves in some way. And we're actually able to predict that if we make them go for a run every day for the next month or something, I don't know, whatever. So whatever the treatment is, then they'll come back in and they'll be like, oh, I thought I was feeling the best I could feel, but actually you are right and I feel better. So I think... Yes, I think that's true, but still, it has to eventually come out in their self-report. No, it doesn't. Like, well, why? why? Not? Uh, because, because, like, I the don't, whole yeah, point. Yeah, if they're is... saying, oh, this, if, if the treatment, if, if you change their brain state to the brain state it's supposed to be in, that's supposed to be the brain state where they realize you've helped them and they still don't think you've helped them. No, there, there are all kinds of people who are deluded about things for all kinds of reasons. And, like, someone, we can figure out, like, that someone was just, really managing his life in a terrible way and he was just sabotaging himself mm -hmm. um and then we have a theory about what he should do that better and we try to convince him to start implementing it and he disagrees and then next week he gets hit by a bus and dies like i could still think i have pretty good knowledge that like what he was doing back then his whole value system was screwed up and he was just wrong yes. right um but yes just like just like if somebody says like you know I'm, I don't think that there's, you know, any reason for me to lower my cholesterol or something because I feel great. And then they get hit by a bus and they're like, well, the cholesterol right. never hurt me. Yes. Yes. I agree with that. But I don't know. I mean, it's, everything is still validated in self. So I do think it's different from health because with health, things are validated by you not dying. Whereas like a, the, no, the core, no, the core but, validation here is self-report of welfare. That is the primary, like, yes, you're trying to make people feel better, but like when again, they, when the they cancer look at patient how could get works, hit by a bus, right? The, no, but, but Eric, when they test, when they test medications, they say like, what's the difference in all cause mortality? What's the difference in mortality under these? Yes, that's how, yes, they, but it's that's not, how they prove the, it works. The point not is based on someone saying for, they feel better. For a particular person, it, it, our theories don't rely on his self-report. Our theories overall have to be validated through a whole bunch of things involving a lot of people that probably involve self-report. But that's what we need to build up the correct theories. Once we have the correct theories and they're very highly validated, it doesn't matter if a particular individual keeps denying and denying, denying. Like, Maybe not a particular individual, but if we notice that the treatment that we had validated through self-report, all of a sudden, all the self-reports over the past 10 years sure. have trended into saying it doesn't work, then you have to, and that- Yeah, that the theory is needs to be improved, bit, like yeah. any scientific theory. But again, you have someone who has cancer and he says, no, I don't want any treatment. No, I don't want any, and then he gets hit by a bus. And so we never see whether he would have actually died from the tumors. I don't yeah. care, like, I, I'm not, like, I, I'm not in a state where like, oh, I don't know whether whether he should have got treatment or not. No, but if if every single person who got the treatment got hit by a bus the next week, we wouldn't have any information about whether the treatment worked. Yes, so anyway, you have to you have to bootstrap yourself, you know, up with a given theory. Once you validate a theory, until you get good counter evidence for it, you know, it, you don't it, like you you've you've now learned something more. There are more levers you have than just self report. Now that you understand whatever the structures are, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, I still think there's a slight difference, though, from medical stuff where you have additional like self-report for certain. Tre I guess like when you're you're, you're saying people would self-report, I feel sick or I feel better. Yes, but we also have the mortality data and the um, like 
how can they physically perform in ways like we don't have those sort of tests for for uh wealth mental or health. health yeah for mental health or for welfare measure someone's income sorry measure someone's income that like that correlates with well-being there are a whole bunch of things with with correlate with well-being one of yeah, which it is correlates self with it that's why we care about it because it, yeah, cor it self-report just correlates, correlates with, with it it's thing no but the pre but self-report okay. is not like an absolutely you know, like undoubtable measure of someone's well-being. Like you're admitting, there are plenty of cases where people uh, will yes. self-report differently from what their actual well-being is. Yes, or that they're in incorrectly predicting what their well-being could be. I think that especially is true. Anyway, uh, Christian, go ahead. Sorry for the back and forth. <laughs> like, no problem. We, we get passionate about these things, don't we? Um, <laughs> Uh, I'll say something. I'll try to make it quick because I have to run in a second. And, and so first of all, let me say thanks to everyone for having this conversation. I really enjoyed it. Um, and I don't get to, this is a subject I've thought a lot about, but I've never had a very robust conversation with other people about it before. So I cherish that. Um, the, this, this question is a really, I think, tricky one because it has a lot of, of consequences in, in what we do with it. Like uh, th this question Eric is putting forward of, or, or this claim, I guess, that first of all, um, well-being is a state of the brain. Um, I mean, I mean, I think we've already questioned that theory in this conversation a few times. Where you know you might take an idealist stance that there's something about consciousness, which you know maybe there's a, a kind of um, bilateral relationship between consciousness and the brain, where it's not all unilateral, it's not all emergent. Uh, but you know, putting that almost impossible conversation aside, uh, it, it's it's. When you look at the outliers, first of all, it, it raises really important ethical questions. Um, so to say to someone like, you know, we're looking at your brain right now and you are suffering and suffering is bad. And we have an ethical system that tells us that's bad. Now we have a legal system that says we should try to do good. Um, it's our moral obligation to stop you from hurting yourself. It's your moral. It's our moral obligation to stop you from suffering. Um, I mean, really, that I'm not saying that you didn't make that argument, Eric, so I'm not saying that that's your position, um, but I see that as like a dangerous uh, uh, landmark in this in this theory that, that we can kind of measure well-being and, and then build systems of justification off of it, um, because then you can start to justify all sorts of totalitarian things for, you know, the benefit of everyone's well-being. Well, you need to um, go through this. Uh, upbringing and you have to eat this diet and you can blah, 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 blah. Like you could just justify total absolute authoritarian control um, based off like, you know, brain measurements. Um, it, it also poses a problem of, um, well, I, I mean, I guess to kind of get back to the first point I was making, well-being, it, it's like the monk question. Can the monk be on fire but be in a state of well-being but then have a deeper and maybe some of his brain measurements are are saying things that we would associate with suffering at that point in our science which might change later and then we say no you can't do that and we've stopped them from doing something and maybe we've taken away something that we call suffering um, but but actually what we've done is we've robbed someone of their inner peace because they were doing what they felt was the right thing to do, what was meaningful, which was good and beautiful, because they thought that by setting themselves on fire or whatever, they were helping to mitigate um, future bads. And so there's this whole question, and, and this could be in the small scale, like maybe right now I'm willing to undergo some suffering because I think in the long term, I'm going to experience less suffering. Right? I'm like going through a valley on the moral landscape or whatever. Um, it, 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 it's, it's really hard to take an objectified uh, science of well-being and then like implement it into practices or policies because how can you tell someone well you'd like to think that you're you know you're suffering in the short term is going to pay off but this is the law <laughs> and and when having recently dealt with a lot of like uh state institutions here in arizona as i do activism i can tell you give give uh, an elected uh office holder a bunch of policy and watch them always deter to avoiding um, liability rather than listening to their common sense, listening to other people's reports and just saying, well, this is what the policy says. We could get sued if we don't follow it. So this is what we have to do. 
and goodbye. It's, it's, it's kind of frightening. And if you expand that into to questions of people's brain states, it's like pretty scary. Um, I could go on and on. Again, thank you all for this conversation. I'm sorry that I won't get to stick around for any replies. I got to make it to the post office. Uh, I wish I could, but take care, y'all. And thanks for organizing this, Regan. Great. Thanks for joining, Christian. Have a good night. Um, there was something, yeah, Eric, if you want to respond to that, and then I'll go to Shine, just since it was touching on what you were talking about. Uh, there was something I was going to say, but I lost it because uh, I was saying goodbye to Christian. Just real quick on the authoritarianism thing. Yeah, I, that I, was I, what it was. I, I yes. understand that concern. Um, and I definitely, I think it's very similar to Stephen's point that, like, let's say we found out there were real psychological, like, neurological differences between men and women. Like, that shouldn't affect our policy. Um, and it shouldn't, and that possibility shouldn't deter research to these differences it brings. So like, I, I think there needs to be a separation there. And if we respect that separation, then the authoritarianism question isn't as much of a risk, but I, I understand the concern. Yeah, I will just promote uh, my blog post, The Axes of Agency, uh, which talks about why sex differences um, shouldn't lead to differences in law. Okay, Shine, go ahead. Sorry for the delay getting to you. Um, so we talked about whether self-report can, um, overrule whatever the brain state reading is. And, and I think it, it is plausible that even in the eventuality of like ultimate technology, that we're still in a state of ignorance because reading out a brain state into well-being, how are you define it, relies on very specific assumptions about consciousness. Like that's either reductionistic or it's a, or it can be subject to like full scale simulation that's not chaotic. I think like most consciousness researchers or neuroscientists might bet against both those possibilities. So it could be that even in the year, I don't know, 10,000 or whatever, we're still in a situation where people get to overrule science or the best because there, there's too much uncertainty. But it, it, assuming it is the case that brain state readouts are quote unquote perfect, then the very same thing that tells you that such a person is secretly well off will also tell you, you know this such a person is deluded or that they are uh i don't know so, that they are prone to lying or that they actually find uh pain uh pleasurable or something like that it should tell you more information so i don't think that that's in conflict with the idea of um uh th that this is possible um uh, but i i, I do want to say like i, I do think it, we shouldn't be so confident in science because there is something there there is a gap here between what science provides which is um measurements that are from the point of view of the universe something third party versus everything we know about subjective experiences is subjective it's first person um nothing in the methodology of science can currently cross that gap uh, and I think some philosophers would argue nothing can. Uh, I'm not that sure about that. Uh, but but it's something to leave uh, as possible and even plausible, I think. Um, yeah, I think uh, I think I think, yeah, first, I, I I I probably was being too pessimistic, and there's a value to being more optimistic here in the sense that you'll never get the science built out unless you believe it's possible to build it out. So I get that. I still think that the self-report is like the ultimate thing, even if it's just that because I think many of us can intuit that there's been times where we were wrong about our what was best for us, it could be helpful to have a doctor that like was like a, you know, much better therapist who was able to give you a much more fine grained and empirically backed understanding of like what's going on and how you could do better. And then you would probably not need any totalitarian person to force you because you would just like try doing what they said a few times and it would work out in the long run, et cetera. So anyway, um, Nate, go ahead. Uh, I was reacting to the slide. Do you want to introduce the slide first? <laughs> this is um Ben Stiller, I mean, Sam Harris. Neuroimaging, uh, that's uh, that's Eric there. So we've also figured out how to grow back the full head of hair um, in the time that we've gotten to this this moral understanding of of neuroscience. 
and uh, that's that's just his brain there. They're mapping out all the happy regions, and um, that the chart you can see it says happiness, and you can see it's been going up over time. So uh, <laughs> Sam Harris has been Doctor Sam has been crushing it. <laughs> okay, so tying back into what Mauricio said earlier with like things like the different kind of value systems being in parallel now, but then like diverging uh, when you go to extremes. Um, so I was thinking about, like, he gives the example of, like, a person who shoots up a school, let's say, um, but then, like, they end up having, like, a large tumor in their brain, right? Mm -hmm. And you kind of feel differently about them morally because of that. So it feels like the thing that, like, is different about that person is that you have a visible kind of identifiable, uh, difference in their brain, uh, and even changeable because you can remove tumors, um, that like you can attribute to the cause of their action right and it seems like there's going to be very interesting um like implications of if we advance neuroscience long enough to where like say there's a school shooter that goes and shoots up a school and you can look at his brain and being like oh he had psychopath brain we can go in identify that that's a thing and fix it or change it to something else um, like what that does for morality. So like a, you might not want to put a shooter in jail that like, you know, had a tumor, like he started acting up once he had the tumor, like you remove the tumor, he goes back to normal. And like, you're just like, oh yeah, no, we fixed the problem that like caused him to do the bad thing. Like you could potentially have advances in neuroscience where you can do that for things that aren't tumors that are just normal brain states. Like, oh, we noticed a lot of resentment in here. Let's go and fix the resentment and remove that. And so like now, do you punish them? Is that just what you need to do? Did you make the change that like you want to have um, for that? And like, how how does that um, implicate punishment at all? Like, is the punishment just your brain has changed? You did a thing that we didn't like and enough of us are agreeing that we should do this, um, that we're just, instead of locking you up or whatever sanction or whatever uh like we're just going to change your brain um and that's like you don't think of it, it as a violation of autonomy when you remove a tumor like that mm -hmm. um but you kind of do when you're just like changing someone's brain in that way and i don't know what the answer is to that but i think that's a very interesting uh thing that advances in neuroscience could end up like causing us to have to deal with i feel like it's not as hard though, because you can just say you can go through a regular trial and all of that. And then at the end, the sentence is either life in prison or uh you let us change your brain, however, I, <laughs> however we I, want. I'm going to be upset at the people who won't let you donate an organ for money, uh who like are definitely going to object to that. Like if like people think money, like uh, you know, ten thousand dollar payout or whatever is like too uh coercive like life in prison versus us change your brain like is is a fight that you're gonna have to have i don't know like that i i get your point but like getting a coalition that agrees to that you, is like not but you can, yeah yeah no i mean but we already do this right to pedophiles like there's there's people who get the the charge where they have to take like certain you know self-castrating drugs or whatever if they want to be out so if if we can do it to pedophiles, we can do it to murderers, uh, I say. Um, Mauricio, go ahead. Yeah, just lots of good points here. Um, and I want to reply to a couple of Nates and even some Christians and Shines too, because there's just a lot of good points brought up. But uh, I want to just continue to raise Nate's thought experiment. I do think that's a really deep thought experiment is what do we think would be right in a future society where brain scanning technology has advanced and it's possible to do those readings. So I mean, it is a very good thought experiment and I'm just going to import some of my religious beliefs. I think every religion is fundamentally colored by the time scale at which you consider. So, you know, in that society, maybe we punish everybody whose brain state is like one minute away from doing something really bad, but maybe 10 minutes seems like too much. They could change their mind or cool off or, talk to their Minority friend Report. on the phone. Yeah, I mean, the movie and uh, I think it was a book by Nordic Report does explore this question really well. So it's good. Um, 
but I just think there's a time scale question there is maybe someone who has a brain state that they're going to do something evil in a year that feels too far out for me because maybe like their hormones will change. They'll stop being a teenager and they no longer feel murderous. So there's some time scale question there, which would be critical for me. Um, and I think another fundamental there is like, why are we basing the brain scanning off of the brains of bad people? I think it would be interesting to consider a society where we scan off of the brains of really good people. And this polar thing, I mean, Sam was aware of this. That's why he chooses to couch the moral landscape in terms of what is the worst possible reality for everybody as his starting point. And I think he does that for analytical reasons, which I observe in statistics too. Oftentimes there's like two algorithms. There's like the theoretically clean one where the proofs line up and you can get very great results, but it's impractical. No one actually runs it. And then there's the practical algorithm, which all the top Python libraries use. And people use that in practice, even if the algorithm has confusing convergence results and it's hard to explain why it works. So that divide occurs in statistics. And I believe something similar exists in morality is it's kind of easier analytically to define what hell is, even if practically it would, there's still some questions there. Um, but practically, I think it would be, so theoretically, it's better to say, what's hell? Let's moral landscape away from that. But practically, I'd want to have brain scan technologies off the best brains. I wouldn't want to assume like, because my brain is similar to a really evil person, I must be bad. I would rather compare distances to like, how similar is my brain to Sam Harris or Gertrude? Define, define best. Yeah, I mean, like, that's, that's a huge question, I think, right? Yes, and there are many religious prophets who have said that, whichever way you think about this, neuroscientifically, linguistically, poetically, uh, physically, physiologically, um, people who are like, really, really, really on, on their game resemble very closely people who are totally insane. And that is a deep religious question is like the most artistic people will sometimes like speak in tongues and they just kind of freestyle rap into the microphone. And it's hard to explain like why that kind of spontaneous living of the spirit is artistic genius, but in slightly different conditions, it would be like a scary person in the room. So uh, I think there's a horseshoe there. And that's what would make the brain scanning fail is like, if your brain resembles a crazy person, it probably also resembles genius people. And I just, there's no way to reconcile that. Yeah. Yeah, there's a question of accuracy. I wanted to ask Reagan, like you're you are immediately like, yes, do it uh, for like murderers and pedophiles, but like how far down do you go? Like if someone just lies a lot, do you be like, yeah, you can either like, you know, have this monetary fine or jail sentence or whatever, or we're gonna change your brain so that you stop lying because that's annoying. Yeah, I mean, I think like if you keep all the punishments as they are and you can choose to have that punishment or you can choose to have this treatment, which should increase your welfare, then I don't see people having lost anything. I think like once you've done the crime, you've already done the crime. So you're going to get some kind of punishment anyway. When it comes to predicting somebody doing a crime, I think there's like more concerning, you know, outcomes with respect to that. But like right now, frankly, I think we're way too lacks in that way like there's so many cases in new york where somebody kills somebody and it's like well that guy had uh, beat up seven people in the past three months and wouldn't take any mental health care and all of these kinds of stuff and we didn't do anything to give them involuntary care so like i feel like we're right now very very far on on the opposite side of that and like when we're talking about somebody who's already committed a crime i don't think they are losing anything by having the additional option in addition to what they would have gotten in the conventional legal system pre brain scan technology. I don't even think they should have to get their brain scanned if they really don't want to. They can just not, not get their brain scanned and be treated just like a criminal would be today. If I may respond a little to that, oh, anyone else can jump in, I get two turns there, double dip. I think inevitably we're gonna see the reemergence of a caste system. And I, that sounds really bad, I can hear that. But I think inevitably it's going to happen. And I myself am Buddhist and um, Dzogchen Buddhism has a caste system. Like if someone proves to you that they're like addicted to meth and follow only short-term impulses, then you don't have to treat their word the same as someone who's proven themselves capable of sitting through a two-hour salon. So there, there is a system of like, if your mind is short-term enough that you're just a threat to yourself and others, then your word just doesn't mean the same as somebody who thinks at a time scale of at least one hour and it's just like two tiers. 
Um, sometimes they separate a third tier, like you should treat enlightened people a little more loosely. Like maybe you should allow yourself a little more trust with a really good therapist because they know what they're doing and they're going to make you uncomfortable in a way that grows you. Um, that's kind of a three tier system in Dzogchen Buddhism, but usually it's two tiers. It's just like people who are too short term to make any contracts with and people who are sufficiently long term that you should at least hear them out you know, say hi to them and trust that they're not going to do something stupid today. But I think we're going to see that reemergence as, I don't know, the moral landscape, maybe more people will believe this and will believe that some societies are better than others. Maybe a neuroscience will provide that some brains are better than others, but I think we're going to see that reemergence. It's just not the case that like everybody is equally likely to shake your hand and not do something stupid. Like some people are very unlikely to do that. And we're going to spot that in some way. Yeah. And I mean, I think uh, from the the point of the criminal justice system is to like identify people who are very likely to keep doing the bad thing and try to prevent them from doing it again um but yeah i mean i i i totally get that other people would disagree with this nate but i think they are wrong and i think people should be allowed to sell their organs and all of that and especially since, okay, sorry, this is just like a small, small aside, but the fact that we allow compensated surrogacy and not compensated organ donation is crazy to me. Surrogacy is like the exact same level of bodily, giving up your bodily autonomy. In fact, it's even more because it lasts for nine months and you can't like get out of it once you're in it very easily. The organ donation, it's like you decided that day to go into the surgery and then it's over. So your consent was like right at the moment of the bottle, like bodily, whatever. Anyway, this is just something I'm like, if we're going to allow compensated surrogacy, we should definitely allow um, compensated organ donation. And I support both personally, but yeah, anyway. I would think that the answer to the question, have we made any headway in the past 15 years, would be a lot more if more people agreed with that. I think that mm. the bioethics of like, oh, like that's unethical, even if people agree to it, uh, are right. a large, uh, like, obstacle uh in the progress that we could have made and yeah yeah it's kind of interesting because it's like we're assuming people can't know what's best for them but then this would be the science of needing to figure of trying to figure out how to tell if people don't know what's best for them but uh we have to let them like experiment on themselves first <laughs> um anyway so i know we're at the time but if you guys wanted to spend like 10 more minutes I didn't get to this yet, but I had just also had one slide if you guys want to talk about like lying um, now moving to like a more practical consideration. So like, let's just take everything from moral landscape as it is for right now. Uh, and then, you know, lying, it's short book. All Sam really says is in most situations that you'll actually encounter, you should just default to telling the truth when we tell white lies, we're implicitly doing some moral calculus that, you know, telling my wife she doesn't look fat in the dress or whatever is overall better for everybody. It, and it's not going to like lead to enough distance between us to justify telling the harsh truth. And anyway, um, so yeah, I guess I, I find it interesting because like the way I understand his argument is he's not going all the way and saying you should always tell the truth no matter what like he always says yeah if I have Anne Frank in the attic I'm gonna lie that I don't so his position is like there's some strictness with respect to lying that we should have somehow he's like pretty sure that most people lie more than the optimal amount that we should move to like a lower point on the scale yeah. no. and I'm just curious how do you like yeah what, yeah go ahead how much of this is just a sermon that like is meant to overcome acrasia, right? Where like you put something out that's just like, hey, don't lie, it's bad. And like that reminds people, oh yeah, I should put some more effort into not lying rather than taking the easy way and for short-term gains or whatever. Um, like but does why? he, be, because like he puts these caveats on like, oh, if it's the subtext, go with the subtext. Or, oh, if you're in a situation where like, the golden rule applies where you would rather be lied to rather than, mm. uh, you know, like if you were in that situation, would you want to know the truth sort of thing? Like it's kind of feels like the uh, utility of him writing lying was like what I would refer to as a sermon, which is just like, you're not, you know, to not do this. Like here's a motivational speech on like, 
you overcoming the uh, acrasia, which means the um the weakness like of the you will. Want to, you yeah 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 correct. Um, but but do you guys do you guys think it's obvious that like so there is some equilibrium amount of lying, right? So do you think it's so obvious that we're like too far into lying on the equilibrium for our own good, or like why would we assume that we haven't? settled at the optimal place that's more my question from like a market dynamics point of view is like uh, for whatever reason I, and the, and this place settles in di at different places in different societies like you'll be in other countries and they'll tell each other that they gained weight and, and stuff like that in a very direct way and i'm just like i'm having a hard time telling like who's better off or whether it's just like so context dependent with all these other norms and values of like what is the right amount of frankness in your society I would love to add, respond to that. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I, I give anyone else a chance if you want. I think I, that's triple good for me. <laughs> no, go, oh, for okay. go for it. I, I love that We're you over asked. time now anyway. <laughs> I love the phrase lying as uh, almost like a market. So I thought about this connection a little bit in my economics degree when I studied counterfeiting. And the counterfeit market is very similar to the market for lying conceptually and dynamically. So uh, one reason you could say why it's bad for that market to exist is because there is no equilibrium. There's no way for counterfeiters to like check with each other to make sure that nobody's putting out too much money and the treasury is going to get wise. And so you see these cyclo dynamics where it's like the market's flooded with cheap hundred dollar bills and then the treasury cracks down, there's none. And then it's flooded and then there's none and then it's flooded and there's none. And I would predict the same dynamics in lying is you have a society where like everyone is not lying and then maybe one person gets away with one and two people get away with one. But then there's a runaway dynamic where like everybody is comfortable lying some of the time. So the family life just degrades. And then there's a cyclical return where it's like, all right, we got to cut the crap. Nobody be sneaking drinks in the hallway. And then everyone cuts the crap and returns to a standard of honesty. So I just one reason why it's really good to have a norm against lying is because there is no clearing mechanism. There's no like person who checks to make sure that the lying hasn't gotten excessive there's only these runaway effects yeah I think that definitely when it comes to like people who are corrupt I guess, I guess like maybe we can use like sort of like corrupt type lying where it's like clearly for direct benefit and separating that from sort of like the white lies where we're at least pretending it's for the benefit of of someone else so I think like the corruption thing works how you were saying Mauricio where like you know in some places there's corrupt officials in the government and that creates a culture where everyone basically has to be corrupt over time but with the white lies thing that part does seem more marketish to me where it's like once you've established that no one tells anyone they look fat no matter what then if you tell someone they look fat you're saying something like so mean whereas you know it's in the context of that culture that doesn't actually mean you look fat right? Like, it doesn't just descriptively mean that. It means, like, I hate you and think you're ugly. Um, Shine, go ahead. Oh, sorry, you're still uh, muted. Um, I agree with you because uh, I think the culture just adapts the level of lying. I, I recall some Australian complaining about immigrants lying as, like, shopkeepers. So I don't just mean, like, stating an obviously high price, but even lying about product quality. But like in that immigrant's original country, like the shoppers understand that and there's going to be a haggling process. So the culture, there, there's responses to lying and it's not clear that it really matters that much in the end, at least for empirically occurring levels of lying. Like, I don't know, maybe there's extreme levels where it is bad, but um, yeah, because there's two parties involved and like there's skepticism involved, I think it, it's not a big deal. Yeah, I um, I will say that Vaish, since who I kicked out because of the <laughs> echoing, but he did have a good point, which I wanted to share, which was like that in his experience, it, it, and this goes somewhat to what Mauricio was saying about like the long-term, short-term person type of stuff, which is just like, it's very easy to think we're calculating stuff up correctly. Just like when we like cal calculate up, should we go to the gym or not? Like, it's so easy to come out and finish that calculus with saying no tonight I should take a, a rest night actually it's very easy to like convince yourself of the calculus that no I shouldn't tell my 
ex that, or I shouldn't tell this person I cheated on them or I shouldn't, whatever. Um, because of the short-term pain versus long-term like sense of satisfaction. So I, I do think that, I do think there, even though I was pushing back on it, I do think there's a reason to think people at the margin likely lie more than is optimal. And so it is good to, to get the sermon as, as Nate mentioned, delivered to you once in a while. Um, anyway, Nate, go ahead. I was going to ask, uh, so I think Rux has made this point. Uh, I want to say Barry Weiss just wrote a thing uh, recently about like misinformation and like trustworthiness of elites um, recently. Um, so like bringing the conversation over to that where it feels like there's a ethos of the noble lie um, that's maybe more so recently. I don't know if it's just like that it's easier to expose it with um, kind of more decentralized uh, information um, that like you couldn't uh, you, you can't like centralize the decisions of what you want to cover and uh, everything as much as you could when there were three uh, TV stations or whatever um, but it feels like we're in the midst of a um, cultural like we think we can cover this up and uh, kind of give you a narrative while uh, telling you what you, we think you should hear rather than being honest with you. Um, and and it, it's, I almost want to say it's obvious that it's too far, but I feel like I want to phrase that as a question um, of like, do you think that that's too far? Do you think that that has relevance to like lying um, as Sam Harris talks about it, or is that a different thing? I definitely think it's too far. And I do think it has relevance. I think it's the same short term, long term thing where it's like this idea that we're just going to tell like early COVID when they told us not to wear masks. And like I know masks ended up not being very effective with with COVID because of how they were worn and stuff anyway. But like there was that period where they're like, oh, masks, you know, healthcare workers really need them. But actually, like they make it spread more if you wear masks on the subway or at least people got I recall that being a thing. And it's like, clearly that was just a blatant lie because they you wanted know the to study, say masks. You know the study in what? Vietnam where like, um, it was like the control group uh, of cloth masks. The control group of cloth masks were, which was worse than nothing. They actually I did do worse than nothing? But um, the nothing was business as usual. You could, I think the nothing condition was um, like, you do what you do anyway. And then there was a like medical mask and then a cloth mask, um, like arms of that. But even the, the IRB like wouldn't allow them to just have a strict no masking thing. So like you could right. say that the, the on sicker patients or whatever, they would wear a mask, but like kind of use their discretion. Uh, but there was kind of a study that supported cloth masks for worse than nothing uh, if you read it a certain way. So like, I, I'm not confident that that was a complete lie. Uh, I think on medical masks specifically, um, like it, there probably was, but cloth masks, there was a reason to think that if you didn't uh, think about it like, too hard. Touch them too much. I think that, I think there was definitely something around like touching it. You're going to touch it more and you're going to like spread it from your hands. There were, def there were definitely things. So maybe that's not a good example, but I mean, to me, it did seem like the primary motivation was not the, you know, slight evidence that it could possibly be worse but that they were worried about people stocking masks and healthcare workers not getting them and it just seems to me so short term it's like you might get people to do what you want for a week and then they're not going to trust you for the rest of their lives like it's and there's going to be other tragedies where you need the populace to trust the authorities and I don't know it, it yeah it seems very short-sighted to me but I do wonder, yeah, I, I don't know. I think a lot, I don't know if it's even like each individual thinks this is going to help their career long term or just that, you know, you're in a situation where like there's not a lot of debate and ability to like dissent. I, I don't know. Anybody else? Oh, uh, yeah, go ahead, Mauricio. Yeah, I think this is where I want to contrast Sam Harris's notion of truth with another of his big debate opponents, Jordan Peterson's notion of truth. And I think their debates were all great. If, if anyone here is a fan of either or both, uh, I think they've met on two or three occasions and they really get in the weeds, except for one, which is infamously bad. And it was such a bad argument. They just did another one the next day or something. But um, this is where I think there's some difference here is uh, 
in their debate on what truth is, Jordan Peterson says truth is kind of what like survives long term. So maybe in some technical objective sense, it was truthfully a better call for someone at the head of the, I don't know, NHS, National Health Service, to put out a statement saying cloth masks don't help. Maybe like the objective thing reading a study in front of them is to say like, this says do that policy, implement masks. But the more true policy would have been to not do that because now there's been a collapse of trust in that institution and the institution won't be able to respond to other health threats in the future. So it's like in universes where health authorities don't shoot up a flare unnecessarily, in those universes, health services retain their trust and they're able to deal with problems better over the long term. And in universes where the director only cares about their career and they make short term calls to cover their butts, in those universes, health services lose trust and the public doesn't go to them in a crisis and those societies suffer long term. So that's where JP's notion is really helpful here, is saying like the truer thing would have been ignore the studies, don't lock down societies because. Now, in the long term, we paid this huge price in terms of social trust and communication. And so the truthfulness of that position is being proven long term as like we wish more and more that we were in that world instead of the one we, we live in. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I don't I find the Jordan Peterson thing. I find it. It's like, sure, we can. Anyway, I do think it's an interesting discussion, but I think that um it like, I guess, you know, Jordan Peterson has a very pragmatic view where he's like, if something works, then that's like the best way that we have of confirming if it's true. I do think like saying that is just like, just say that. And then we can like keep truth as meaning something that actually corresponds with like reality underneath as a separate vocab word. But that's just my personal take. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to think about like the... The, oh, yeah. The other point I wanted to ask you guys on the lying thing was like, to what degree does this have to do with your own mental state? Because like he makes the argument against lying less about how you're going to impact others and more about how you're going to impact yourself. I mean, he does say it's like better for people around you to know what's true, too. But um, what if you're somebody like I knew this guy when I was in my early 20s and he was like a generally smart guy and he just cheated on his girlfriend constantly all the time and he had absolutely no guilt like I couldn't it was really interesting and like I think I think he did I think that might have changed over time but like he wasn't experiencing all the downsides that most people get when they cheat on somebody because he just didn't think about it he wasn't stressed about it at all so I'm like if you're one of those people then I don't know is your like optimal rate of lying just higher yeah, I doubt uh, people who are narcissists or sociopaths are going to get much from Sam Harris's moral landscape. <laughs> I yeah, mean, probably not. Yeah, I, 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 hmm. yeah, I mean, you have to have a conscience in order for lying to feel bad to yourself um, or, you know, care that it's hurting others. But um, the people who don't care, like, uh, you know, probably aren't going to read Sam's books. Yeah, uh, probably not. <laughs> I think that but... your lying threshold, there, there's a difference between uh, like questions about how you feel about something um, versus things that like can be found out. So mm -hmm. like if your partner loves the movie Star Wars and you hate it and you just don't want to tell them, like I think there's a like level at which you can um like i mean i guess that's a little bit more but like there, there's no like underlying truth i guess um that is going to come out in the way that like sleeping with someone else uh is like an external thing to you versus just like oh do i like this uh you can kind of lie and say no as long as you're committed mm -hmm. to it um, yeah, or like if you tell somebody you love their cooking every time or something, like that is not that's totally impossible to find out because even the Star Wars somebody from your childhood could be like, oh, he hates Star Wars. <laughs> right. If you've told other people, like I don't know, there's if you're someone like that that doesn't cause any stress to you, 
uh, and it's an opinion of yours that like doesn't have any like cashing outs and you don't tell other people either. Like, I think there's a case to be made for like, uh, you know, if the um, telling the truth would be in a bad quadrant on the risk re risk reward matrix, like then it's more justifiable to like continue that lie um yeah. and just say like this is this is what's true to me it doesn't matter what like my internal like feeling is or whatever uh i'm going to consider this to be true like i do like star wars now and uh like we're just going to move forward with that being the truth yeah and i wonder if there's like also some called like again like the cultural context where it's like certain types of lies even if they were found out even if you'd prefer they don't get found out when the person finds them out, there's like an equally likely chance that they'll think it's cute that you bothered to do the lie because that also shows like, like, I don't know. I don't think I'd be that upset if I found out that my boyfriend doesn't like my cooking as much as he says. I feel like I'd be like, I don't know. I feel like that if, if it's somehow, I mean, first of all, it could never come out, but I feel like I'd be like, well, I liked getting the appreciation and made me want to do it more. And I don't know, like, I just, whereas like, yeah, obviously if somebody is lying to you that they're cheating on you, sure, they could make some kind of reasoning that it was to protect you, but it's so obviously yeah. selfish but that, when it, you know. When it comes to cooking, and I don't know if Sam gets this specific, but like maybe there are ways to, you know, um, be honest without being, um hurtful just like suggesting like where there's room for improvement <laughs> right yeah so, so i think like i want to make a distinction between like if i tell you i like your cooking you're more likely to cook more for me whereas if there's like a divulgence if i'm married to somebody and i'm actually really attracted to my neighbor or something mm -hmm. uh like the lie to say like no i'm not attracted to her is like in line with the thing that i want to happen like i um i don't know the like um the the there's a consequence of lying about the cooking where you're going to get more of it and not like it again whereas like in a different scenario, you could say like, okay, the lie is like making the world be more like what I want it to be. Um, and I don't need to actually divulge the like actual feelings yes. um, that I, I have. I think I know, I think it is. Okay, so it's like, and this one's happened to me before with gifts where like, you know, I, you know, when you're growing up or something and like you are really into something at a certain age and then you have to tell your great aunt, like, please stop buying me Harry Potter. I'm like 19 now. And, yep. you know, it's the time has come and gone. Um, so there's like that one, I think, is the example of like you're bringing the thing that you don't want by lying versus and okay and even in the cooking example if you hate the food you shouldn't lie but if you like the food a lot it's just not but you're like saying it's awesome when it's actually just like good enough that you want them to continue cooking then that would also be in line with the future you want to bring about can i jump in here uh i <laughs> yes, think ahead. we'll resolve paradoxes like these is introducing a time scale uh, i think that is, it breaks so many paradoxes why I'm obsessed with repeating this phrase, but uh, using Nate's example, if I was on the first date with a person and she asked me if I liked her cooking, there I would say, and let's, let, and let's assume I didn't like what she cooked. First date with a new person, I don't like what they cooked. Like I tasted it and it like was a bad, pleasant experience. It was a bad sensory experience. And the person I'm with, let's say they asked me, do you like, do you like my cooking? In that case, I would say, yes, I like your cooking, and I believe it is truthful because on the time scale of the first date, maybe I'm assuming a lot of things about women that I go on dates with, but on the first date, if you tell a woman, I don't like your cooking, in my head, I encoded the message, I don't like your cooking, and her head will be decoded as, you don't like me, or you don't like spending time with me, and those would be lies. I don't think those things... So I would say I like your cooking because I know it will be received as you enjoyed this date. You enjoyed this time with me. You want to have more time with me or something. So this is super key to people who develop like post-moral reasoning, like people in their thirties and forties who start to like make their kids suffer a little bit to really appreciate what they have. This is that 
post-moral kind of thinking is you start to realize like, just because in my head, I imagine a certain set of sentences and that gets me to do a certain thing, saying those sentences out loud is not going to achieve the same effect in other people. Maybe you don't speak Spanish. So that's the set of words that explains my thinking, but it'll have zero impact on you at all. So on a first date, I would say I like your cooking, but maybe by date like three-ish, I would say I don't like your cooking because now by date three-ish, we've established enough connection that I now know- I'm furious because you've been lying to me for two that's, days. But that's <laughs> where, you know, I my religion, like many others, says that miscommunication happens and confusion happens and it's just a fact of life and sometimes good people hurt each other and it's neither of your faults. It was just the way the system evolved. So yeah, no, I, I, I think you're right I, though. You have to take take into account the culture. This is the same thing with like if somebody says, Did I gain weight or something? It's like, you know, you want to answer that objectively, but given the cultural context and all of that. Um, and yeah, the last thing I say, I can't remember because I was it's been a while since I read this the lying book. I, but I remember I'm pretty sure he had an example where he's like, Oh, if your if your wife says, like, do I look fat in the dress, just tell her she looks beautiful. It's like, what woman is not gonna know you're saying, Yes, I look fat in the dress if you respond that you look beautiful? That's uh, so <laughs> low level thinking. Like, please, that's not gonna work. Um, anyway, hey. I will let it close it there. Did anybody have any thoughts that they want to talk about this or any of the topics that they didn't get out before we um hang up? Well, just to bring it back to honesty, you know, I think honesty needs to um, shouldn't be like this monolith on its own that's at the top of the pyramid. I think like um, all individuals should strive to like have a certain level of like emotional maturity where like they actually do want people to be honest with them, even if it hurts them and to separate like what are specific uh criticisms that don't that they can separate from like being tied to their identity or worth as a person and um you know maybe that's a bit of stoicism um or like non-attachment in eastern philosophy um but i think that's you know that has to be um that has to counterbalance any attempt to you know name honesty as one of the highest virtues yeah anybody if else want to... oh yeah go ahead if a, if a bio bioethicist who's evaluating whether or not you can donate an organ asks you if you're like have any history of mental illness or uh are nervous about the operation you should lie to them and say that everything's fine because the consequences we all what we really care about is the consequences in terms of the welfare of conscious beings which will be best served by the lie long term and short term um anybody else <laughs> all right well um thank you guys for coming uh and we will have one more um final salon in this series uh in an additional month and uh sam looks so beautiful there i just gorgeous um but yeah so the last one is going to be a we're not going to be talking about a specific work of sam's or anything like that it's just going to be like more of a broader topic about the value of conversation like how how sam harris as a in like public intellectual has approached that and like critiquing and questioning sort of who has he platformed over time like has his like how have have thoughts around that evolved like post covid for example like he used to have he he for example had a bunch of people that he was associated with who post covid he is now like they all think he has tbs and he thinks they're all conspiracy theorists and and whatnot so i think there's some like interesting topics there um and just what yeah what public intellectuals should and can do to like further the conversation i guess anyway um am i yeah. am i am i right in summarizing summarizing that as we'll be ruthlessly judging sam as a public intellectual and his body of work and who he is as a person <laughs> i think that there, i think that the most interesting thing is going to be around the you know the weinstein rift and and you know marie so you brought up jordan it's like jordan and Wait, sam are which, in such different places now for example and um yeah weinstein uh Brett mostly okay. I don't I don't think Eric and Sam were ever yeah. like no. 
I'm really I, I'm close? not aware of the context, but I was specifying not Harvey. No, no, <laughs> okay, okay, no, 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 no. Whoa, um, deep read. <laughs> Brett and Eric Weinstein. Um, if anybody, yeah. Anyway, decoding the gurus. I don't know if anybody listens to them, but I don't always agree with them. But they have some fun fun clips of of everybody but uh but yeah so I think that'll be interesting and like I just the reason I think this one will be interesting is also just Sam who was who was the apostate is Muslim apostate that he like wrote a book with I am her sealant man it's a man oh Salman Rushdie no no I know it's like I, I don't know. The point is, he wrote a book with this guy, and now they're like again. There's yeah, Majid Nawaz. Like, oh, Majid Nawaz. Majid yes. Nawaz, the end of faith and radical yes. Islam. Exactly. Anyway, there's been a, there's been a number of people that Sam has like really diverged with, so I think it'll be a, an interesting conversation from that perspective, as well as like how he's been seen by by the public over time, like what he's done with creating a non ad based model, which like a lot of other creators have taken on. And anyway, so uh, yeah, thanks everybody for participating. This was this was really fun and uh, have a good rest of your evening and weekend. Great salon, Reagan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you guys uh, next month, hopefully.